but at least I was recording that time. Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds so good. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Stop that. And Big Anklevich. Okay, this is exactly the kind of male douchebaggery that is about to take a real hit around here. Hello. Welcome to the Dean Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 138. <laughs> Episode 139. <laughs> You're heading the wrong direction. Episode 138. That's right. Today's story is the deed of Tetramena. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Uh, dead of Tetramena. I hope you didn't say it that way. Oh, I said it that way all story. through the whole reading. Oh, shoot. Good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, today's story is the dead of Tetramena by Mark L. S. Stone. What does the L. S. stand for? I'm pretty sure LS stands for long suffering because yes, it, this is one of those lostest of our lost episodes. No, 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 this was never lost. Well, it that's was true. Just it was just given in, to the wrong person. What were you about to say? <laughs> it was just put in your hands, which is just as good as losing it. I am uh, Rish Outfield of Kyohar. And I am Big Anklevich of Gorlim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do we need to say about this episode? Anything uh, first? I don't think we need to say anything first, other than we can tell them about Mark L. S. Stone. Mark L. S. Stone is a returning author to our show. What else did he do? He also did the wonderful and humorous The Invisible Kingdom many moons ago. I think he may have already submitted this story by the time The Invisible Kingdom got made, so that just tells you how long his suffering actually has been. Let me look real quick and see if we can get... No, don't don't look. Just a little over a year. That's not too bad. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, it's been worse. <laughs> not <Okay>. much. <laughs> okay, by day, Mark, a long-suffering stone, is a middle school science teacher in Oakland, California. By night, he prowls the streets, doing good, taking down bad guys, and... He's also a middle school science teacher. He actually doesn't do anything. Those lessons don't plan themselves. By weekend, and during the summertime, though, he's a writer. He lives with his wife, Abigail, and a lizard named Jabberwock. Cool. Which is probably much better cared for than my poor lizard named Leo. Oh, see, I don't think I knew that your name was Leo. Your dog's name was Cat. I don't think I knew that your lizard's name was Leo. Now you know. And what is knowing? I choose not to answer that question on the grounds that it may incriminate me. Well, then we'll move on to the story. The Dead of Tetramana by Mark L. S. Stone. A hundred hundred voices spoke in unison, drowning him in their clamor, scraping him raw with their power. We have decided to give you a second chance. He woke, drowning in fear and pain. He screamed, limbs thrashing uncontrollably. Strong hands held him down, and voices shouted to be heard over him. He heard someone saying, It's all right, Eric. It's all right. You're safe now. He had barely enough time to recognize his name before he was unconscious again. When Eric woke the second time, he was surprised to find himself free of pain. He was in a bed, with white sheets in the center of a large room. High windows set with blue glass bathed the room in azure light, partly counteracted by a glowing white sphere hanging from the ceiling. Eric tried to sit up, but a woman sitting by the bed took his shoulders and gently urged him to lie back down. Good morning, Eric, she said with a smile. Welcome back. What happened? Eric asked. Who are you? 
His voice had an unfamiliar sound to it. His throat still hurt from screaming. The woman frowned and tilted her head. When her smile returned a moment later, it looked forced. My name is Hannah, a hospitaler, the woman replied. Her tone was brisk. You've been very ill, and my instructions are to see you become well again. What happened? Eric repeated, more insistently. You died, Eric, Hannah admitted. But the congregation was able to pull you back before it was too late. How? That's something between the agents and the congregation, Hannah replied. None of a simple hospitaler's business. She held a wooden bowl to Eric's lips, paused while he readied himself, and filled his mouth with a spicy, pungent liquid. Drink, she said sternly and gently. Let me do my work and make you well. Eric felt heavy and sleepy, and he was unconscious almost immediately. They gave me a woman's body, Eric said, not for the first time. The reflection in the mirror in front of him was a tall and raw-boned woman in early adulthood. The body's catchstone was a blue diamond set into the forehead. The face was nice, at least, symmetrical with sharp features, but a little lean for Eric's tastes. It didn't matter what the body looked like, though. He had been awake and ambulatory for more than a week now, and he was still uncomfortable in his new skin. You really aren't in a position to complain, Hannah replied. You didn't exactly take care of the last body they gave you. The last body was mine, Eric said quietly. He looked away from the mirror to see that Hannah's usually sour expression had softened a little. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't know. She crossed the room and took Eric's hand. Despite her hard tone earlier, her face now showed real regret. It's not your fault. Not a lot of us are in our original bodies these days. A new body is always a shock. I remember when I was first assigned this body. Is it much like the one you were born with? Eric asked. Hannah smiled and lifted one hand. I was in my fifties when the beasts came. This is more like my body twenty years before. Hannah reached out and caught Eric's hand. Her grip was comforting, even though her tone became businesslike again. Your original body was always going to die someday, Eric, and you were always going to survive it. Everything you really are is up here now. She tapped his catchstone. The gesture was unexpectedly intimate. Eric was too shocked to pull away. Then there was a knock on the door. Hannah squeezed Eric's hand before crossing the room to open it. A young man with a green oval catchstone stepped inside, bowing formally. The congregation wishes to know if the agent is ready to come before the hearthstone. I am, Eric replied. He was as well as he was going to get any time soon. Hannah caught the messenger's eye. A moment before he goes? The messenger nodded, closing the door so that Hannah and Eric were alone again. So you really don't remember me? Hannah asked, crossing her arms. Eric frowned. I don't think we've ever met, no. Last year, it was a few days after midsummer. You said you had just come back from some mission to the Rakiri Waste, something so important you could only hint at. I admit that you had totally taken me in. An agent's life is terribly glamorous. Suddenly, Eric did recognize her. He sputtered, trying to regain his mental balance. Did, did you, uh, do something different with your hair? Hannah laughed and shook her head. <laughs> <laughs> Don't screw this up, Eric. The congregation might take that body away from you and set you analyzing reports or something. Whatever it is agents do when they don't have bodies. I'd hate for you to stop being a woman without getting a chance to learn something. She laughed at Eric's stricken expression <laughs> and continued laughing while he let himself out of the room. <laughs> The Hall of the Stone was a large chamber in the center of Kaiohar. The only illumination came from the heart stone itself, a huge, irregularly shaped chunk of blue crystal suspended in the air by copper struts. Once it had been a final bastion where the minds and souls of Kaiohar had hidden from the beasts. 
Now it was the home of the congregation, the psychic gestalt of those who failed to maintain their individuality during that long interregnum. Welcome, Eric of Kailahar. Eric felt the congregation's presence coiling around him like an enormous hand, holding him firmly but gently. I am ready to serve. We are pleased that you have recovered, the congregation said conversationally. Some portions of our self feared that you would not. The techniques that called you back from death are still in their infancy. Many have underestimated me to their ultimate detriment, Eric replied. It was a cocky thing to say, but it felt good. How far back do your memories go? I recall a mission as a diplomatic attaché in Gorlin. My memories become fuzzy towards the end of the engagement. I've been told that I didn't die in Gorlim, however. Can you give me more information? You died in Shul on what was thought to be a routine information-gathering mission. How did I die? There was a pause as the congregation considered his question. This in itself was enough to send a chill running up Eric's spine. The congregation, with its abundant mental resources, was rarely at a loss for words. When the congregation finally spoke, Eric's anxiety turned into dread. We We do do not not know. Before Eric could reply, the congregation spoke again. We We have have need of your power, power, Eric. Eric. From each all his power to each all his needs, Eric responded automatically. I will answer the need of Kyohar. As you always have, you must go to Tetramana. Shortly before she was expelled, our diplomat reported that she had uncovered a project to import accoutrements of our art into the city. The dead of Tetramana cannot wield our powers. But, but they are too wise to waste their time and they have no chance of success. Be warned that although we are not currently at war, since our diplomat was expelled, we currently have no embassy to Tetraman. You mean if I'm caught, I'm on my own? <laughs> Eric replied with a psychic laugh. The congregation couldn't lie, but it could mislead and sugarcoat the truth. Indeed, we We have assigned you a Tanu bodyguard. Eric wrinkled his nose. You know how I feel about Tanu. We must insist you and your body are too valuable a resource to endanger. Eric sighed out loud. Ah. Very well. When do I depart? Immediately, if you are able. Eric contemplated the congregation wishing, not for the first time, that the congregation had a face that he could read. If Eric seemed too cocky, the congregation was likely to decide that he would put his body, Kyohar's body, in unnecessary risk. On the other hand, if he was too cautious, the congregation might decide that he was no longer useful as an agent. I am Eric of Kyohar, and I am ready to serve. This is good. The congregation replied. Eric felt his unfamiliar body release tension that he had not realized he was carrying. Your Tanu bodyguard and equipment awaits you at the water gate. Good fortune follow you, Eric of Kailahar. Eric knew that for a dismissal, so he bowed smoothly, turned on his heel, and left the congregation's presence. Normally, Eric would make a small detour between the Hall of the Stone and the Water Gate. He had kept a small stash of equipment in his quarters, knives with balances he found favorable, poisons and potions that the authorities of Kyohar found distasteful, but Eric found indispensable. A small stash of foreign currency and his boots. It was a minor but forgivable violation of Kyoharan law. The various support staff who worked with the agents often managed to supply him correctly, but when they failed, it was a matter of life and death. Those treasures were lost with his original body, though, so Eric simply headed for the water gate and hoped for the best. 
The water gate was Kaiohara's least impressive entrance, a simple stone archway in the complex's outer wall. Long ago, the Kaioharans had used the water gate to carry water into the city. The wells that fed the city now were centuries old, but the name stuck. These days, the water gate was mostly used for unobtrusive coming and going. The bodiless soldier who kept watch from an emerald set into the keystone was actually a low-ranking agent. Upon reaching the water gate, Eric immediately went to the horse that had been prepared for him and started rifling through the saddlebags. He saw calming incense and a cloth mandala for meditation, a grappling hook and length of strong cable, a small spyglass, several wax paper packages of various poisons, a set of fighting knives and throwing irons, all with blackened steel blades, and other important odds and ends. Eric smiled. His handlers had done a decent job, this time, though he still missed his own gear. Greetings, great one. A voice came from Eric's left. Eric turned and saw his Tanu bodyguard, waiting patiently just beyond the water gate itself. She was tall and rangy, with muscular limbs and sun-beaten features. Like most Tanu, she had straight dark hair, which she had tied into a club where her neck met her skull. White paint made slashes on her cheeks, and a white diamond on her forehead, where a Kaioharan would have a catchstone. The white signified that this woman was Tanu, rather than one of the other remnant tribes that lived in the area. Eric didn't know what the slashes meant. He had never bothered to learn the ins and outs of the Tanu caste system. The imitation catchstone marked her as Tanu Kayo, one of the Tanu given the honor of working for the Great Ones. Just call me Eric, Eric said. The Tanu woman seemed uncomfortable with this request, but replied, Of course, Eric. And what's your name? Or am I supposed to call you Tanu or girl? I am Nara, great... Nara stopped and corrected herself. I am Nara. Excellent, Eric replied, swinging himself into the saddle. His new body's altered center of balance threw him, and he nearly fell, but he grabbed the saddle horn to steady himself. Now mount up, and let's be on our way. She did, and soon they were on their way, riding through the steps that surrounded Kaiohar, east towards Tetramana. From outside... Kaiohar was a huge spire of blued stone, sapphire windows reflecting the morning light. They passed outbuildings as they rode, garrisons, farmhouses surrounded by fields, watchtowers, supply houses, and facilities for experiments best performed outside the congregation's all-pervasive psychic aura, and waved to the Kaioharans and Tanu who labored there. The Kaioharans waved back while the Tanu bowed gravely as soon as they saw Eric and his body's flashing catchstone. The buildings and fields became less frequent as they rode. They reached the border with Tanu lands around midday. At sunset, Eric and Nara made camp at the base of a gnarled tree that grew alone on a hilltop. Before them, the steppes of Ko swooped down into the forested valley that formed the demilitarized zone between Kaiohar's Tanu allies and Tetramana. Nara started a fire, while Eric walked in a circle around their camp, gathering fallen tree limbs to serve as fuel. He made a ward as he walked, setting up a self-sustaining loop of psychic energy that would alert him of any flares of ill intention within its bounds. Nara went to sleep after eating, leaving Eric to stare moodily into the fire. He made a telekinetic hand and used it to lift a burning ember to his side. By that light... Eric read and reread the briefing that had been included with his supplies. As usual, it was frustratingly incomplete. The Tetrans had begun work on a new tower complex, a building project usually reserved for the rise of a new master. When the diplomat inquired after which thrall was being elevated to mastery, her questions were deflected, and she was summarily ejected on a flimsy excuse. <laughs> Eric laughed to himself. The Tetrans were about as bad at subtlety as diplomats were at gathering intelligence. Eric read the report until he was sure he'd gleaned all the information he could. His dreams, when they came, were sad and bloody visions that left him almost as weary as he had been when he closed his eyes. Yeah. <laughs>
An inhuman, high-pitched ululation interrupted Eric and Nara's quiet progress through the forest. Eric jerked in his saddle, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever or whatever it was that made that noise. The woods were dark and misty, the fog an omen of the wet, moist weather of the Tetran plains and wetlands. There are varur in the woods, Nara said, noting Eric's surprise. Varur? Eric asked, unfamiliar with the Tanu word. Broken ones. Eric nodded and pulled his thick black cloak a little tighter. Stay close, so I can protect both of us if we run into one. Nara obediently urged her horse a little closer to Eric's. Our stories say that the Varur were once a tribe like the Vanu, Nara said. But they offended the gods and were cursed. <laughs> Eric laughed. The story amuses you? It's just not true, Nara. Eric sighed, disgusted with the ignorance and dependency Kaiohar tolerated among the Tanu. You know about the beasts, don't you? Of course, Naru replied. The beasts who hunger came to glut themselves on human souls. Some people stayed in their cities to fight, and the beasts consumed them. Others fled to the wilderness and survived. That is how the Tanu came to live in the steppes and sleep beneath the stars in tents and booths. That's close enough, Eric allowed. But the story doesn't end there. Some of us realized that the beasts hungered for human souls, and if we became something other than human, maybe the beasts would leave us alone. The Great Ones were once human? Nara seemed surprised. Eric laughed. <laughs> the Great Ones are still human. You know, this is why they don't normally give me Tanu bodyguards. I won't play along with the lies the congregation uses to control your people. We're men and women, same as any Tanu. We come from a city that studied the psychic arts, and we changed ourselves to survive the beasts. But we're still human, more or less. Nara thought about this for a moment. When she spoke, her voice was soft and her tone measured. But you still have much to teach us, because you hid from the beasts and your arts were never lost and destroyed. Eric nodded. That's right. It's far from a one-sided arrangement. He cocked his head and smiled. You're taking all this well, you know. Last time they gave me a Tanu attaché, he panicked when I told him the truth and spent the rest of the night praying. As I understand it, he was never the same. What's your secret? There is more than one kind of truth, Nara said smoothly. And there are things I know that you don't. As Eric opened his mouth to respond, a naked, ragged-haired man burst into their path. He paused and looked at them through glazed eyes. Nara screamed. Eric urged his horse forward. When his horse wouldn't go, Eric reached out with his mind and seized control of the horse's simple brain, forcing it to step forward and put him between Nara and the Broken One. The Broken One's eyes snapped into focus, and he smiled cruelly. He opened his mouth and croaked out an unintelligible word. Fire erupted around them, bursting out of trees, soil, rocks, and thin air. Eric cursed and pushed his powers to their limit, his catchstone glowing bright blue with exertion. The fires turned aside, only scorching the trailing ends of their cloaks and their horses' tails. Nara's horse screamed and reared, but Nara kept control of it long enough to fire off a shot with the sling she wore at her side. The stone caught the man in the throat, knocking him backwards. Nara hurled herself from the saddle and leapt forward. Eric had never seen anyone move so quickly. Before the broken one could recover from the slingshot, she had pinned him to the ground with her spear through his chest. When her horse started to rear, Eric reached out and grabbed its mind too, forcing it still. Eric swayed in the saddle, exhausted. The effort of keeping the fire at bay had nearly drained him, and he was having trouble holding down both horses' animal desire to panic, buck off their riders, and run. We have to get the horses away from the blood and fire smells, Nara said, grabbing the horses' bridles and leading them through the forest. As the horses calmed, Eric gradually released his hold on their minds. Once the horses were completely calm, Eric signaled for them to stop and slid from the saddle, stumbled a little then found a place to rest and slid to the ground with his back to a large, gnarled tree. 
The broken ones hid themselves from the beasts by doing something to their minds. Eric continued with a sigh. They broke themselves apart and distributed themselves among all their bodies. Something went wrong, though, and they couldn't put themselves back together again. You never know what a broken one is going to do when he sees you. Laugh, cry, run, speak, attack, or use magic. Because you don't know what bits of person that body contains, or which one will come to the surface. We should put them out of their misery one of these days. While Eric spoke, Nara had started a small fire. Eric could see her face flushed with fear, exertion, and excitement. The flickering light of the campfire made her seem wild and lovely. Eric knew what he would do now, if he were in his own body. He'd subtly play down her contribution in the battle, just enough to make her feel like she had something to prove, then turn the conversation into flirting, and from there... Eric couldn't continue to follow that chain of thought. He was still too uneasy in this new body. Would this new body respond to the same things his old body had? Was this body even aroused? Would he be able to tell if it was? And if he successfully seduced Nara, what would he do next? He felt like an awkward teenager all over again. You're good, Eric said instead. Nara looked up from what she was doing, some kind of detailed leather work with something in her lap, and smiled. How so? I've never seen anyone move so quickly, and I've trained with some of the best biokineticists and martial artists in Keohar. I expected you to be a hunter and a soldier, but I didn't think you'd be so fast. I am more than a hunter, Nara said. Eric blinked. That hadn't been the response that he'd expected. The congregation did not send me to you. I am here to protect you because my chieftain pressed them to send me at my request. Eric grunted and hauled himself to his feet. <sighs> he was not in the mood to deal with this right now. I need to make a ward in case more broken ones come sniffing around. I'll make camp. Eric tiredly nodded his thanks and began his circle. The rest of their journey towards Tetramana was uneventful. Although there had been no seduction, Nara seemed more comfortable with Eric and opened up about life among the Tanu. She told stories from her years growing up along the banks of the White River that ran along the northern border of the Kaioharan steppes, how her uncle, the hunter, had taught her to catch fish, and her older brother, the shaman, had taught her to revere the Tanu gods. She told Eric about how after her husband's death, she had come down from northern Kaiohar to live nearer to the spire itself. Eric was impressed by her calm acceptance of what fate had delivered to her. In return, Eric told Nara about his childhood and life before the beasts. Translating his stories into a modern context that Nara would understand was difficult, but Eric nonetheless told her about his early years training in the psychic arts, how panic had set in when the beasts arrived, and the frightening and painful procedure through which the catchstone was implanted to permanently free his mind from his flesh. He admitted his grief at waking to discover that none of his family had survived the long sleep and how that had influenced his decision to become an agent. At the end of one of Eric's stories of adventure, Nara cocked her head to one side and said, This is not your original body, is it? Eric shifted in the saddle, a little uncomfortable. Is it that obvious? You let it slip in one of your stories, Nara replied. Then she smiled. You never know what to expect from the Great Ones, so it's hard to say. We humble Tanu try hard not to predict you, but I think you make a convincing woman. Well, I am a spy, Eric said with a laugh. And yeah, I Then he told her more about his last decade as an agent in the service of Kaiohar and the congregation. He told her the stories of midnight raids, of clinging to windowsills until his fingers cramped. He told her of the exotic places he had been and the women he had met and left. His tales carried them through the rest of the forest and nearly to the gates of Tetramana. You'll need to wash off your face paints, Eric said. It was morning on the last day of travel. We're travelers from Chul, which will explain your Tanu accent. 
Though to be safe, you should speak as little as you can. What about you? Nara replied. Eric grinned and replied in a heavy Chulian accent. Oh, I'll do fine, I do think. His smile widened as his catchstone pulsed, then disappeared, hidden by Eric's power. Then Eric replaced his elegant Kyoharan linen with rough furs, hid his knives in the folds of leather. A little coal from one of his pouches darkened his hair, and some red pigment made a woman hood mark on his body's forehead. When he looked up at Nara, he was the image of a Chulian merchant adventurer. With her white paints removed, there was nothing that marked Nara as a member of a tribe allied to Kaiohar. She could just as easily be Viseki or Aluren, other remnant tribes who were related to the Tanu, but lived nearer to Chul and were not allied to Kaiohar. Eric explained part of their mission as they rode. The Tetrans are erecting a new tower. They do this often enough, but they're being unusually close-mouthed about who this tower is for. Naturally, if the Tetrans want to keep something from us, we need to find it out. That's why the congregation sent me. At length, Nara asked, Eric, what are the Tetrans? Your people have stories about Tetramana, don't they? Of course we do. Nara admitted uneasily. But our stories about the broken ones and the great ones were wrong. Now I don't know what to believe. Do your tales of Tetramana fill you with fear and disgust? If they do, then they're probably true. Tetramana is like Kyohar. We both changed to escape the beast's notice. We both gave something up. But we stayed human in Kyohar. We stayed alive. Not so for Tetramana. The Tetrans became dead things. Nara grew pale beneath her tan. Eric smiled encouragingly. We won't be in Tetramana long. We'll ride in and take a room at an inn, just another merchant and her servant. I'll go and investigate the matter. It will take one trip, two at the worst. We'll be able to leave tomorrow or the day after, none the wiser save the congregation. We'll be back in Kyohar before you know it. Nara's answering smile seemed a little thin. Together, Eric and Nara rode past the tall gates and into Tetramana itself. Black dominated the city. Black stones, black iron, and black cloth. The Towers of the Masters were huge, hulking structures with crenellations along the tops. Each master's standard flew from the pinnacle of each tower above the standards of their allies. Eric thought the symbols were generally repulsive— White fangs on black fields, swords dripping with blood, staring eyes surrounded by flames. The atmosphere was oppressively warm and wet, with overcast skies. Less permanent buildings crowded the streets between the towers, ramshackle buildings made of wood, where Tetramana's human inhabitants, the slaves and employees of the masters, made their homes. Eric booked them a room in an inn in the northern quarter and waited until nightfall. The inn, run by a mortal Tetran under the protection of a master, was of higher quality than most. Built to withstand the cold Tetran winters, it had thick walls and small windows, making the interior uncomfortably hot and muggy. Eric made sure that he and Nara were seen eating dinner in the common room, and then walking up the stairs to their chambers. Then he changed into his blacks, slid his knives into their sheaths, tucked his poisons into their pockets, and crept out into the night, following directions he had memorized earlier. Eric wasn't surprised to discover that what had been a construction site when the diplomat had been ejected was now a finished tower, the black stone still sharp-edged and new. There were guards at the front gate, but Eric confused their minds so they didn't see or hear his approach. He opened one of his paper packets and blew a puff of sleeping powder into their faces, then left them slumped at the front gate. Likewise, picking the lock was no challenge. Eric stepped past the antechamber and began his ascent. The Tetrans liked to be near the sky. With their allergy to sunlight, Eric couldn't imagine why, and he was most likely to find answers on the upper floors. He was also less likely to find Tetrans. They were nearly insensible by day, true, but at night they would be out and about in the city. The masters of Tetramana liked to keep their social calendars full. There were more doors inside, but Eric picked each lock and continued on his way. 
Eric stopped to search some of the rooms he encountered, but found nothing out of the ordinary. A library, a room for martial arts training, a parlor, a windowless bedroom for inhuman Tetran guests, a barracks, and a small kitchen for human thralls. This was not Eric's first experience breaking into a master's tower, and it began to seem as though this really were nothing out of the ordinary. Eric was wondering if he, the diplomat, or the congregation had made a mistake when he finally stepped into the room on the very top, the Tetran's personal chamber. The walls were covered in bookshelves, and each shelf was packed with books. The titles sent a chill down Eric's spine. These books were about the psychic arts, the arts of Kaiohar. The room's shelves and tables were littered with a variety of psychic paraphernalia, gazing stones, meditation rugs, soothing chimes, and incense burners where familiar scents still lingered. No wonder Tetramana had wanted to keep this tower a secret. Whatever master lived here, he was probably the most serious threat to Kaiohar the Tetrans had managed in decades. The Tetrans were immortal and physically powerful. The psychic arts were Kaiohar's only advantage. I was pleasantly surprised to discover that many of my arts are quite compatible with my new state, a voice said mildly. It was scratchy and dusty and came from a shadow in the corner of the room a shadow that Eric's eyes had somehow slid over. Eric stepped back, fighting knives sliding out of their sheaths. Of course, some of my arts are lost to me now. Mind over body, for example, is completely useless. But I am better at walking unseen than I ever was. A walking corpse stepped out of the shadow. In life... It had been a tall and slender man, with muscles honed by years of training. The body's movements were still graceful, but the skin was gray and cracked, and the muscles were withered. The man would have been handsome, once. His eyes still had the same confident glitter, but their green irises were clouded over with cataracts. An unnaturally black catchstone glittered in the dry skin of the corpse's forehead, partly obscured by gray and broken hair. Looking at the figure, Eric experienced a strange double vision. Floating above and behind the walking corpse was a luminescent and tattered human form. The ghost mimicked the corpse's movements with a slight delay. The ghost's face was not ravaged by death and rot, and other than its strange pale glow, was still recognizable. Eric was looking at what was left of himself. You did well, the other Eric rasped. After all, we're the best. But I've been waiting for the congregation to make their move. And when they did, how could I fail to recognize my own mind? The corpse laughed. (laughs) Or at least a fair copy. No, Eric choked out. What did the congregation tell you? Did they tell you that you died a chul? They said they didn't know how I died. My memories start to fade at Gorlim. Gorlim was where I began to partition my mind, to hide parts of myself from the congregation. You remember Dahlia, don't you? One of Tetramana's shadows. Gorlim was the first time that Dahlia and I met for no reason other than to compare philosophies. And Chul was where I finally made the choice to defect. Dahlia showed me how my trust in the congregation was misguided, and my place in the scheme of things was not as fixed as I had originally thought. Why betray Kaiohar? Eric asked. Why? I am the fastest, the smartest, and the most psychically gifted of Kaiohar's agents. Why should I live in military quarters? Why should my body grow old and die so that one day I can compete for the congregation's attention with the rest of the rabble? The other Eric snarled at the thought. I am better than them all. Dahlia helped me see it, and I deserve to live like it. I deserve to live like it forever. Eric shook his head. He didn't know what to think. You probably still believe in the body shortage, don't you? I did. 
until Dali pointed out how convenient it is for the congregation and how easy it would be for it to sabotage our efforts to create empty shells for us to inhabit. Everyone knows the congregation can't lie. Can't they? The dead thing asked. Didn't they lie to you? They knew I didn't die in Chul. You are nothing to them. An arrow loosed by the congregation. A knife in their hand pointed at my throat. He laughed and continued in a more thoughtful tone. <laughs> when I kill you, do you think they'll just send another copy? How many do you think they'll send before they decide that killing me has gotten too expensive? Eric gritted his teeth and stood a little straighter. Death was something he understood. Perhaps he was a copy, and the original had defected to Kaiohar's greatest enemy. He had a mission to complete, and he knew what came next. That won't happen, Eric said, shifting his grip on the knife. Because I'm going to kill you. Don't be stupid. The dead Eric waved his hand dismissively. Let's work together. I can make you immortal, too. We can be twice as powerful as one of us alone. Or, if you can stomach the danger, you can go back with some plausible story and feed us information from the inside. The High Masters of Tetramana will reward us. Eric hesitated, and the walking corpse continued. I know that you have doubts. They're the same doubts I had. I know about your frustration with the ignorant dictates of the congregation. I know you want a better standard of living than Kaiohar can offer you. I even know how sick you were of returning all your gear to the agency storerooms after each mission. In Tetramana, there is no limit on what you can own or the luxuries you can earn. If you know everything I know, Eric replied defiantly, then you know I am dedicated to the dream of Kaiohar. I also know that your dedication is flawed. The corpse's smile was ghastly. After all, here I am. Yes, here you are, dead and wasted, your own ghost bound to your desiccated body. What luxuries do you get to enjoy? Does wine taste sweet to a dead tongue? Do the corpses of Tetramana screw each other in their crypts? When was the last time you tasted wine? The corpse countered. When was the last time you enjoyed a soft bed? When was the last time you really felt that you had the respect of the people you obey? Eric's shoulders dropped in defeat. He turned his head away, but not before he caught a glimpse of the other Eric's victorious smile. Then he moved. He dashed forward like lightning, pouring energy from his mind into his borrowed muscles. The Tetran brought his hand up in guard, but Eric managed to score a long, deep cut along his forearm. Sluggish black blood oozed from the wound. Eric darted back and readied for a second attack. Eric wasn't ready for his opponent's ferocity. The other Eric snarled like an animal and crossed the distance between them like a black blur. He lashed out with a knife. Eric recognized one of his knives, the knives he had missed upon waking, and caught Eric square in the chest. The knife and the hand that held it burst from his back, splattering the wall behind him with bright red blood and shards of bone. The other Eric looked him in the eye, but he was too much of a professional to say anything. Eric felt his limbs growing cold. He reached up with one hand and caught the other Eric's wrist. His other hand reached up feebly and caressed the other Eric's pale, dry face. Then Eric released his hold on the dying body's catchstone. He hovered in the air for an instant, pure mind, invisible and without form, and then dove into the body in front of him. The counterattack caught the other Eric by surprise, and Eric had one psychic hand on the tainted catchstone before the original Eric could move to defend himself. No! The other Eric screamed. Eric felt himself losing ground against the original psychic onslaught. You cannot have what is mine. This body is mine. This life is mine. Mine! Eric nearly lost his grip on the catchstone, 
Without a body or a crystal to sustain him, the trailing ends of Eric's mind began to unravel. Suddenly, Eric realized that he was going to lose. It wasn't that the original was powerful or skilled. Eric knew that he was those things too, even if he was a copy. The original Eric had the strength of his convictions, selfish and materialistic they might be. He believed in something. Eric knew he didn't believe in anything. His faith in the dream of Kaiohar, broken down by years of service, could not sustain him now. It hadn't even sustained his original against the entirely mundane seductions of a Tetran agent. He had nothing that compared to his original's fierce defense of what he felt he owned. Eric's grip on the catchstone shuddered. It wouldn't be long now. He thought of Nara, probably sitting awake in the inn, waiting for the Tetran soldiers to kick down the door and drag her away. He thought of Nara praying to her Tanu gods. She had such strength of character, a capacity to accept life's good and bad with calm and peace, and so much faith. Nara. Eric thought of Nara. He thought about Hannah and all his friends and co-workers and everyone else he had dedicated his life to protecting. He thought about Kyohar and all its people ground beneath the boot of Tetramana forever. New strength flooded Eric's psychic presence as he remembered what he did believe in. I am Eric of Kyohar, he replied, and I am ready to serve. The fiercest battle in Eric's life happened at the speed of thought. In the space of a handful of heartbeats, Eric shredded the psychic presence of his original self. The Eric who had sold out Kyohar was gone, and Eric found himself back in a body he remembered intimately, but had never actually inhabited. The body wasn't what he remembered, though. Eric felt the dull silence where his heartbeat had been, and the rotten heaviness of his limbs. His body was cold and empty, a haunted house no one had lived in for years. He fell to his knees, his victory falling to pieces all around him. He had won, but now he was trapped. The door opened without a sound, and a woman in a pale feathered mask stepped inside. Nara removed her owl mask and placed it gently on the table by the door. To Eric's gray-tinted vision, it seemed that the mask turned into an owl and flew away, but he couldn't be sure. Everything seemed unreal. Nara kneeled next to Eric. She had put her face paints back on, but they were different than they had been before. Rows of white dots had replaced the thick white lines beneath her eyes. Her body seemed very warm, and Eric thought he could almost see the spark of life inside her. He knew that he could draw that spark out of her with a touch and make it part of himself. He felt a distant, gnawing hunger. Hello, Eric. Go away, Eric said, not bothering to ask how she had recognized him. No. Eric clawed idly at his flesh. It was dead and papery beneath his fingernails, and Eric felt bits of it flake off and fall away inside his shirt. You can't do anything for me now. It's over. He laughed. <laughs> I won. I know. Nara replied gently. I'm here to help. I have deceived you too. I did not come because I am Tanu Chio. I came because my gods, the gods of the Tanu, commanded it. I am not a warrior and a hunter. I am a shaman. She smiled. The Kyoharans are not the only ones who keep secrets, and I told you that I was more than a hunter. Eric regarded her dispassionately. Part of him screamed that she was a human being, a citizen of Kyohar, albeit a second-class one, and protecting her was his duty. The rest of him, the part dominated by his body's hungers, reminded him that it was hungry and cold and she was warm and full of life. They knew. They told me that a man was about to be used, the way one uses a tool or a weapon. They said that a man was about to be loosed from his home, the way an arrow is loosed from a bow, and that I must be there to help him. Why would your gods care about me? I don't know, Nara admitted. But they are here. She put the hide bag she carried on the ground and began to draw out implements. Masks 
tiny clay pots, feathers, a rattle made of a turtle shell. Our gods are in all things, Nara explained. They are raven, fox, wolf, and spider. They are trickster, warrior, lover, father, and friend. Our gods are the masks the world wears day by day. I can take the taint away from your body and heal your soul, but it will be difficult. You will have to do everything I say. We will each play many roles tonight, and not all of them will be this easy. Do you understand? Are you ready for this? Eric noticed that he had begun to shake from hunger. Nara held out the mask, but he didn't pull away. Nara placed the mask on his face. Eric stood before the congregation, back straight. He considered his course of action on the long trip back from Tetramana. The ritual that had restored life to his body had left him nearly as weak as his first resurrection, and they had been forced to travel slowly. Fortunately, they had not been pursued from Tetramana and encountered no more broken ones in the woods. Eric and Nara had stopped to rest every night at the garrisons or outposts they passed, but Eric had kept the full story to himself. As far as anyone knew, he was merely an agent returning from a secret mission to Tetramana. He had told everyone that his black catchstone was the result of a terrible battle with a Tetran who had thought to usurp Kaioharan mastery of the psychic arts. This conversation was for him and the congregation alone. Now that he stood before the congregation, Eric found it difficult to contain his feelings. How dare you? Eric demanded. Eric imagined that the patches of light and darkness within the congregation's crystal body shifted uncomfortably as it replied, We We did did what we we thought thought best. best. You were one one of our our best best agents, agents, and you you had been compromised by Tetramana. We did did not want to risk sending sending another another agent in such a dangerous situation. situation. It It was was determined that the greater greater good of Kyohar would be best served by the tactics we chose. Did you expect expect me to die die there? there? Your Your victory over the original and the survival of the copied intelligence were the best possible outcome, though we determined that it was highly unlikely. We never anticipated that you would be able to reclaim your body and restore it to its pre-tetran state. However, we are pleased to welcome you home. Eric suppressed a snort. How do I know I can believe you? You lied to me. The congregation hesitated. We have learned how to deceive when we must. It is painful and unhealthy, but possible. There are situations in which it is best for Kyle Hart not to know what we know, and decisions we must make in secret. What else have you lied about? Eric pressed. How can we trust you if we know you can lie? The only reason we allow something as inhuman as you to rule us is that we believed we knew your limitations. You do know our limitations. Lying is difficult for us. We will not use this ability to extravagantly. Is the body shortage real, or are you using it to control us? Eric continued. Did our original bodies die during the long sleep because our powers failed? Or did you arrange that in order to create a situation in which you could place yourself in control of a limited resource? Were the beasts real, or have you tampered with our memories? Is all of Kyohar living in fear and deprivation because it's convenient for you? The congregation recoiled before the force of his speech, so powerful and angry that it was almost a psychic attack. We We are are sorry we have violated your trust. We ask you to give us a second chance we extend it to you. What chance? You used me! He remembered what Nara and the original Eric had said. I was a weapon in your hand, pointed at someone's throat. An arrow you loosed at an enemy. You saw me as a thing, not a human being. Explain to me, congregation, how that is not counter to everything Kyohar stands for. We did what we believed was correct. 
Eric was out of words. He simply stood in the congregation's presence and breathed. Finally, the congregation spoke again. Had Eric not known for certain that the congregation was barred from his mind, he would have thought they were reading it. Kyohar will not survive a civil war. If you reveal to Kyohar that we are capable of making copies of Kyoharans, or that we have learned how to lie, it will tear our nation apart. I know. Now it was the congregation's turn to wait while Eric decided. He tried not to enjoy the experience too much. There were so many possibilities. He could blackmail the congregation, just like he had arranged for the blackmail of so many of Kyohar's enemies, milking his secret for all the comforts and authority he could. Eric could tell everyone the full story and end the congregation's rule completely. Or he could do what he felt was best for Kyohar. I don't believe you're a tyrant, Eric admitted at last. But I am leaving Kyohar. I can't serve here anymore. The congregation considered his statement for a handful of seconds, then said, We have need of a long-term agent in the Gorlin holding of all deep. You will have a great deal of latitude to act independently in pursuit of Kyohar's best interests, including traveling elsewhere when necessary. This agent will not be expected to report with any frequency or regularity. Will you answer the need of Kyohar, agent? I accept the assignment, Eric replied. Then he turned on his heel and left the heartstone. Nara met Eric outside the gates of Kyohar. She still had their horses and had gathered supplies while Eric dealt with the congregation. Several rabbits hung from a saddle horn. What did the congregation say? Nara asked. (laughs) <laughs> Eric laughed. Maybe I shouldn't tell you. Maybe you should tell me. You're the one who has the wisdom of the gods in her belt pouch. Nara smiled. You know that it isn't like that, Eric. If the gods have anything further to say about your life, they have not shared it with me. I am going to Gorlim, Eric said. I don't know about you. There was a long silence. When Eric spoke again... His voice was quiet and humble. He suddenly found that he could not meet Nara's eyes. Will you come with me? I don't know what's coming next. I don't want to face it alone. I've never seen one of the children of the mountain before, Nara replied at length. Eric looked up to see that she was smiling. Is that what your stories say about Gorlim? Come on. I'll tell you the truth about the Gorlim on the way. He swung himself into the saddle and kicked his horse into a gallop into the east. Nara followed him, away from Kyohar and Tetramana alike. Author's note. Hi, this is Mark L.S. Stone, author of The Dead of Tetramana. I'd like to say this story has three inspirations outside of myself. The first is the amazing novel Making the Cut by Chris Lester. You can find the podcast of this novel at metamorcity.com. In addition to being really brilliant, absolutely worth your time, it also tells the story of collectivist psychics fighting uh, capitalist vampires. Uh, And I recommend it. Uh, uh, The second inspiration is transhuman science fiction, which is a growing subgenre of sci-fi that talks about how technology could totally transform the experience of being human. Body swapping, photocopied consciousness, people being uploaded into new bodies after their old ones die. These are all really common themes in transhuman sci-fi. And it bugged me that fantasy never gets any of the love. So I decided to take those themes and apply them to a new setting. Eric's world was born. As far as the story, in a lot of ways the inspiration for the story comes from something that happened to a friend of mine. He was a real womanizer, he had a lot of girlfriends, and he often ruined his relationships by having sex a little too soon. Well, uh, he had a near miss where he 
thought he might have been exposed to HIV. Luckily, it turned out that he wasn't. But during the three months between his ex potential exposure and the second test that confirmed that he was clean, he met and started dating a girl. And in this situation, his um, inability to have sex with her, because he was being a decent guy, led him to get to really know her. So I wanted to play around with that in my story and, um, you know, see what happened if I took somebody, kind of a 007 character, and put him in a situation where he couldn't charge ahead, where his normal approach was useless, and he was forced to actually become friends with somebody. Uh, and as you can see, it worked out pretty well for him. It worked out for my friend, too. He's married now, actually. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys will pay attention in the future, because I have other stories starring Eric and in this world. Uh, keep Stay tuned to um, the internets for The Prince of Gorlim, The Secret of Rakir, The Broken Varer, and of course the story of Eric's triumphant return in Eric of Kyohar. So thanks so much for listening, thanks the Dunesy for publishing my story, and um, have fun. I'll catch you guys later. Bye. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I'm sad to have heard what he just said because there's no way the Steve will still be around <laughs> for all of those stories. Can you imagine how long it would take me to produce each one? <laughs> Although maybe they wouldn't be as extensive as this one was. In fact, that's a, probably a fun thing to talk about. Now, uh, I didn't prepare a cast list. Oh, uh, that's right. We're, we're going to have to delay this episode another year while we wait for you to prepare a cast list. Oh, I'm we? not. I don't. We, we didn't use to prepare a cast list, did we? We would just say, hey, thanks to whoever the person who did those other lines. Uh, thank you, too. Did we ever do that? <laughs> if it was somebody, Liz Mirzeski or something, we would say thank you to her. We wouldn't say she did this character and this character. We yeah. We, or did, did we ever forget to thank people? I think the cast list didn't show up until uh, after we stopped producing and therefore we had people that were reliable enough to prepare a cast list. <laughs> let's see if we can remember. Let's see, the narrator and sometimes voice of the congregation was Rish Outfield. Eric was played by A, Renee Chambliss, and B, Big Anklevich. Who was also a chorus man. Who was also a, a choir member. He was in the congregation. Congregation. A member right. of the congregation in his local church. There was Kim Price, who played the voice of the nurse, whose name was Hannah. There was Julie Hoverson, who played the voice of Nara. Nara, there you go. Now, there was one guy that came in and said, they're ready for you now, or something like that. Yeah. Um, one line. I think that was Joe Zija, right? I think you're right, but how did you recognize him from just the one sentence? I, I have a vague something at the back of my head tickling saying, hey, that was Joe Zija. Remember, he recorded those lines the same time he did the lines for the question. That's where he says, hey, it's Doc Z. He's on Channel 10 or whatever he said. All right. Okay, before we get into the whole conversation of the production, Lisa Wilde did something for us. Lisa Wilde? She doesn't do drawing. anything. Who did the what giant you, eye drawing? Oh, that Lisa Wilde. Yeah, Lisa Wilde did the art for this episode. And if you're like me, you loved it. Because I loved it. So the drawing of the assassin brat doll is... Uh, <laughs> I think this art looks freaking amazing. And you can actually see that it's Renee. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I always like her stuff, though. It's just so well done and so interesting to look at everything that she does with all the various art that she's done for us. Generally, she does these characters that have these ginormous eyes, which, of course, makes them look more vulnerable, which worked great for something like rain or beachcombing. And in this case, when she's drawing an assassin, she can't make her look so vulnerable and wonderful, so she had to tone down the eyes quite a bit. They're still large and uh, prominent, but they're about the same size as the catch stone in the uh, character's forehead, which is uh, interesting. Uh, uh. Well, it's neat that we have these people that are willing to do art for us for no compensation, right? Because Abby Hilton pays, well, Abby Hilton makes an embarrassing amount of money for her writing. 
but she pays a pretty penny for that art. She too. does. Yeah. I think she's still yet to actually turn a profit because she t- <laughs> pays people so much money for all the tons and tons of art that she commissions for her stories. Yeah. <laughs> but if you wrote a short story collection or a novel or something, you think you would get Lisa to do the cover art for it? Oh, I would love to have Lisa do the cover art. I asked that question. I mean, you're never even going to write a short story, let alone a collection. <laughs> but, True, I suppose. But, but yes, yeah. thank you, Lisa, for doing that for us. If you're just listening to this, and uh, if you're blind, I'm sorry, but you can just go to the site. And, and now you embed the picture on the file. So if they have something that's, that's right. not an iPod shuffle, they can see it. Right that's now. right. As long as your iPod has a screen on it, you can just look down at your iPod and see the art that comes along with it. It'll be much smaller than it would be if you go to the website. But maybe if you have an iPad, it'll be nearly the same size. I don't know. Because those are pretty big screens. Cool. Enough about people that aren't me. <laughs> Okay, so we thank Mark L.S. Stone for sending this in. I had one of those really peculiar experiences when I read this. I I was at my parents' cabin, and the cabin's electricity runs on solar power. And so once it gets dark, it tends to run out. And uh, the power had gone out, and I was still reading this thing, and everybody else was asleep. And I was just, oh, I was so into it. And I'm sure I was reading in, you know, aloud and doing voices and stuff. I just, I loved this story. And more than that, though, I just, I felt like only I could bring it to life. Uh, Hence, it's been months and months and months (laughs) and months. It's the two stories that I produce a year. But it was also the most challenging production i've ever done two stories you produce a year it's been more than a year since this one came in right but i did you've got a friend (laughs) oh okay right i suppose you disagree okay i helped with you've got a friend you gotta you you helped with this too didn't you yeah a lot less than i did with you've got a friend i spent all sorts of thankless hours putting in like sound effects into that I hope you just story. made them with your mouth like you did just now because <laughs> you actually did, tracked them down I did and I did the robot as I made them while recording it I couldn't make a sound without moving an elbow or something I think what you're doing right now is the cabbage patch technique. oh dang it uh, I was never good with those 80s dances <laughs> but yes like I was saying this this was hard and part of it was how do you convey a male character in a female body. And the way I chose to do it was to have Renee do all of the speaking parts, but the psychic projections, yes, the thinking lines were you. And then when I was returned to myself at the end, my lines became normal. Right. And then when you run into your old body, that is also you. That's true. But we didn't mention that in the cast list. I played dead me as well. <laughs> right. If somebody else had produced it, they might have done it in a different way. And I I won't know until listeners comment whether it worked or not. But that's how I chose to do it and to do the congregation with the multiple voices. And and when you heard it, was it hard to make out what they were saying? I didn't think so. I really enjoyed the effect and the way the congregation's lines came out, actually. It was really interesting because when we recorded it, how many times do we read it through each line? Was it just it twice? Was usually twice, but sometimes we'd do a third time because one of us would do a high voice or you would do the somebody's hiding in the air voice. And <laughs> yeah, I, I just remember doing it several times. But the, the cool thing about the way that that effect came out is that different voices would pop out and sound like the lead voice each time. You know, one time... It sounds like you're the lead voice, and then all of a sudden, the next line, it sounds more like my voice is the lead voice, and the next time, a a lower version of my voice is the lead voice, and it kept moving all around, which really made it seem like a congregation. Oh, cool. As opposed to two guys recording the lines twice. And we had done that kind of stuff before, where you speak at the same time, and... It's so hard to get the inflection and the breath and the pause exactly right because when you do it the second time, your pause may be longer or right. shorter or your pace, you may be going a little faster. And trying to match all those up was infuriating. It took hours. <laughs> but you did a good job. It turned well, out nice. So I, hopefully that you think it's worth it. If people can understand what they're saying, then I was successful. But in the past, we'd talked about, you know, well, let's get Renee or let's get somebody to do a female member of the congregation. 
but it just it it would be so difficult to I mean, how would she know how fast we were saying the lines? Right. Yeah. The only time that we've done that before where we actually got other people to try and do lines that were in unison was for Kevin Anderson's story, The Ghost of Sadie Worth. The de- the Okay, The Ghost of Sadie Worth. Was it The Ghost of... Okay, The Sadie Worth story. Anyways, it was where we were all chanting... I believe in Sadie I Worth. I believe in Sadie Worth. That's it. And I had to get all the people that played the characters to chant it together. And I think what I wound up doing was we recorded our versions of it and then... I emailed them, okay, here it is. Make it match this. And uh, with some of the people, I could actually hear. It was like they were listening to it out loud instead of with headphones. So I could even hear us in the in the background a tiny bit saying, now, I believe in Sadie Worth. That would work if it were the congregation. Right. But if it's only supposed to be four kids, you don't want to hear. I, does th- it- I think it worked okay because w- the voice was another character. You know, you didn't notice. It's not like there was an extra person or something. And it was really low, so you didn't really hear it anyways. But that actually worked out. They sound like they were chanting together, and I thought it turned out pretty cool. Other times that we've done it, we've always just done me and you doing it. Like when we did uh, Town of Golden Woods, where we had to all speak in unison. It makes us sad (laughs) to to be lonely alone. alone. That's right. It's so funny (laughs) that you remember that. And everybody does things differently. You and I have that benefit that we're in the room 98% of the time when we record things, we're together. So that's a benefit. And as far as like uh, other choices, like Julie did the character of Nara, and I told her kind of how I wanted the accent to be, but I didn't want it to be a do a German accent or something like that, because this is a fantasy world. Right. And she was consistent from the very beginning. There's so much more material that she produced for me. I don't know, this is probably my 20th episode or something like that, or production at least. And I've always in the past where the description says, you know, they converse through the night or something like that, Uh had to take lines from earlier and just underlay them very, very, very quietly, hoping that nobody pays attention to what they're saying because it's the same lines that came before. And both Renee and Julie, independent of me asking them to do it, just ad-libbed conversation that unfortunately I didn't realize they had done until I had already (laughs) started to lay in like alternate takes of their earlier lines of dialogue. And then suddenly I got to this stuff that wasn't in the script, so to speak. I was just, I was, I was, uh, what do they call it? It was an embarrassment of riches. And to me, that was just so neat because Julie probably talked in this accent for five minutes or whatever. And then finally she downshifts into her normal voice and says, hopefully that was enough. And so I couldn't even use all that. I had to just pick like four sentences the and then four sentences from Renee. Or what. Um, it made me love these two. Well, maybe that's a creepy thing to say. It made me appreciate the heck out of these two <laughs> actors for going above and beyond. Now, granted, they do this sort of thing for a living. You know, they're 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 semi-professional, if not professional, voice actors. Well, Renee's voice definitely actors. a professional these days. Yeah. She's reading romance novels and stuff. No, no, no. I, I know you know she is, and I, I don't know if Julie does that. I think she may still just do her own show. Still, nineteen, 19 Nocturne Boulevard it's, yeah, is. It's yeah, top notch. Uh, then for you, how to convey like a rotting corpse, but you still understand what he has to say because. <laughs> Talk like this and nothing can they understand. Yeah, we had to go back and redo those ones after I did that. You that didn't voice. do that. <laughs> that to me was a thrill, even though this was so much harder than other productions that I've done. It was a really slow process, the editing, with like the chorus stuff took forever and that. And I, I got it in my head that I would, I had to have a sound for every time he cast a spell. <laughs> and so I made this. <laughs> noise and then i altered it and like turned up the treble and lowered the- anyway i liked the way that it sounded i don't know if it sounded like me making that star trek next generation phaser sound <laughs> but that's what it was did it sound like i was making the sound or it's hard to say i haven't gone through it with headphones on i listened to it on cheap computer speakers the one time that i've listened to it through and so i did hear those sounds i couldn't say if they sounded like this or that <laughs> Well, now they'll sound really like maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, People that will be I like, know. oh, that's. I'm going to go through and remove them all <laughs> if yeah. only I could. Yeah, you can't now. In the forums, 
uh, sometimes people agree or disagree with the choices that a producer makes. And lots of times I'd be like, wow, good job. Thanks for your comments. I dread to hear people say, <laughs> oh, it was just so stupid of you to have a male inner monologue for a female character. I, and, and I don't know how else you could do that. We could have had you do a feminine voice and like change the pitch. And that I, I don't know. I, I think it worked Regardless, the way it I, is. I did it the way that I did it. And early on in the story is established that they gave him a female body. So I think people will understand what's going on. Okay. And then uh, Kim Price was the other voice. And she did the nurse, Hannah. Right. And she was the main girl on the question, right? Right. You produced the question and I produced this? And they were about the same time or? <laughs> about the same time? Well, the question well came started six about the same ago. time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard to find the time. That's why. Oh, I know how it is. You've got more time than me now. That's why I I only get one done a year or two done a year. Um, and, and again, our show would not even exist if people didn't volunteer to be producers for us. Because would the audience put up with a three or four month wait in between episodes? I don't know. Yeah, there might be a few diehards that don't finally just unsubscribe from our feed, but... Uh, they, they keep assuming, oh, oh, they've pod faded again. Oh, we know they're back. <laughs> oh, they must have pod faded. It was just that last dying kick. Oh, no, 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 they're back. They put out another <laughs> one. Uh, okay, now they've pod faded for Stop sure. Stop it. Hopefully <laughs> we will never fully succumb. They're probably thinking that already right now. They're like, oh, Petra Mana, there's another Dune, Steve? I thought, thought they were just that gets my goat now. Well, maybe we earned that. <laughs> Uh, and you've experienced that where there's a story, you really like it, but you, you're you too busy and somebody else produces it. And every single choice that they make, you second guess, whether that you're like, wow, I never would have thought to do that. Or it's like, oh, I wouldn't have done that <laughs> kind of thing. But if you're not producing it, you don't have a say. You don't That's get to true. say we need somebody with a French accent in this scene, even though it never says in the text that they should have an accent. And so that's the thing is I so wanted to do this one that I did. And I hope that uh, Mark Stone thinks that it came out well. The thing about the story that I liked the most was the world that he created. There seemed to be so much that we didn't know, but Mark knew. Right. About the history of the people with the catchstones and the congregation and the warring countries and the Tanu people and their beliefs and that and to me, that was just really neat. And when he said just now that in his author's note that he had other stories in the series, I was like, oh, of course he does. But it hadn't occurred to me until just now. I don't know. I think that that's such a fun thing about the Harry Potter series or the Star Trek universe or, you know, any series where you realize that the world is much bigger than the characters that are in it right now. Right. It's much wider and more expansive universe than you've been able to see just yet like the stephen king's his dark tower gunslinger universe or whatever when i first read gunslinger and you get these little hints of other things that are going on like the guy at the piano playing hey jude in right. an old west environment or whatever i was just like whoa whoa what is this and, and then they talk about the old arthur eld and and the land of the gunslingers and all this stuff and he's just like oh wow how much of this does he know? And and that's the cool thing about fantasy or science fiction. Sometimes these guys sit down like Tolkien or whatever for years and plot out what the world is like and draw a map. And this is the history of this people and, and all that. And I, I don't know. That's something I've never been ambitious enough to do. But I know that you had ambitions to do that sort of stuff when you were in high school and the, the post-apocalyptic world. And, and you, recently you were pitching to me uh, a science fiction universe where Earth had pretty much been decimated by alien invasions and and, the, and all that. And I just from listening to you talk for a half an hour, <laughs> I knew that you knew way more and there was way more potential for stories. And you knew but that only, you didn't want to collaborate. Yeah, I didn't with want to have it. anything to do with it. <laughs> And it was because of that. It's like, oh, well, this guy knows all this. St I could never. I'll tell him, you know, they're, they're on a moon. And he's like, no, 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 the moons, they were harvested for fuel. I was like, what? <laughs> How do you know all this stuff? Anyhow, that's just something I admire about writers in this, not in this genre, but the, the milieu of this is my world and these are the rules of the world. That's just something that 
I appreciate because it's outside of my grasp. Yeah, it's one of those things, especially when you get something like this. I mean, this is just a short story. It's it's like the first time we heard chemo or something. You know, you're just like, wow, this is a, this is an interesting idea. There's got to be more to it than just this. And you find out, in similar to this one, he he had several other stories. And maybe a, a year from now, Mark Stone will be like, hey, I've got a Kickstarter campaign going to get my book written or whatever, um, which would be cool. Uh, because yeah, we he, he's given us five or six titles already of uh, other stories that are out there and uh, they're names of lands that we heard a little bit about in this story but we don't know what the deal is with them obviously there's stuff going on in those places too you know what i think is kind of funny about this story and other stories in the along this line this we, we talk about the city of kyohar uh-huh i'll give everybody five seconds to guess how you spell kyohar Oh, that, this is this was a lesson that I learned the hard way. You tell Renee and Julie how to pronounce all these places. <laughs> oh yeah, they went through and like pronounced every different way, didn't they? Yeah, and then I had to write were... them back and say, "Oh, I bet you still didn't guess Kyohar." <laughs> I never uh, had them redo it. I just it was okay with Julie's, especially because she was supposed to have an accent anyway, so she could say it totally wrong if she wished. The, the word is actually spelled C-I-O-H-A-R. So if it weren't for the fact that the author told us, hey, this is how you pronounce this, and this is this, and that is that, we would have never, ever get, I would have seal har, I probably would have tried, but I never would have made that a hard C. Just because that's just not how you do it in English. A C I is always a soft C. And so it's a good thing that he said that because it would have been all the more awkward when we got to his author's note and he says, and then the concluding story in the saga, Eric of Kyohar. We'd be like, oh, no, it's it's Kyohar. Aww. Well, hey, I apologize to those voice actors that had to say it multiple <laughs> ways. Yeah, I tried to make it work without bothering them to do it again. But uh, And, you know, I also apologize that it took me so darn long to get this done. Yeah, Joseph Zija probably forgot that he ever recorded that one line in here. <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten. <gasps> it's right at the beginning of the story. The other thing that was really neat was just that, you know, he was stuck in this other body, which I guess, you know, we'd seen with like Steve Martin or Dennis Quaid or something like that. But we'd never... Then he runs into his real body and his real body has been corrupted I don't know. Just never, that's something so sci-fi or so comic booky to me of just uh -huh. the running into yourself, but yourself is bad now. And how do you feed yourself? Oh gosh, I loved that. It, I didn't know that that was coming. Maybe somebody that listens to Escape Pod often did, but I just <laughs> I felt it's one of those things where you have a a twist coming or a revelation coming or whatever. Darth Vader is Luke's father. When you hear it. You're like, of course, why didn't I see, you know what I mean? He, he asks how he died, his body died, and they're sort of evasive about it. But I never even for a second thought, well, his body is still out there waiting for him. Right. Yeah, but once I heard it, it was like, of course. And I love that about fiction when somebody takes you on a merry chase and then slaps you with something that was right in front of you the whole time. <laughs> so excellent work, Mark Stone. That's right. That was good stuff, sir. You know, if Rish produced your story, you probably did a really good story because he didn't want to let it go. And there's been a few times where I've actually had to just wrest control of a story from him and just say, no, I, sorry, I already sent it out to all the producers and one of them picked it. I'm afraid you're, you're too late because, you know, it's better to have it's better the to have story it produced actually get done <laughs> than to have me say, "Oh, I still I've got to start on that. Maybe next year." But yeah, so there are stories out there that Rish would have produced if he had his druthers. But yeah, you know, if you if you get Rish producing your story, you know, you really uh, struck a chord with the editor. And same with you, because usually you've got other things you have to do now, and for there to be one. There has to be something that speaks to you about it, where you feel close to it or you feel connected to it. or, or I don't know. There is something about that. You'll, you'll hear about these, you know, like Sam Raimi wanting to make the Spider-Man movies because Spider-Man meant so much to him. and Or like Guillermo del Toro doing The Hobbit. How? Oh, wait. 
Anyhow. Mm. All three hobbits? Three. (laughs) (laughs) Which leads us to the Comic-Con conversation. Okay, so we do have an announcement or something that we want to talk about. But first, here's Comic-Con. And then if you have any interest in finding out what we're about to say, we'll see you on the flip side. Yeah, there was a girl uh, dressed. uh, There were lots of girls dressed as Katniss Everdeen. But there was one in the red orange dress oh like the the, the one, yeah, the one that's supposed to be flaming. And, goes on yeah. fire. and i thought that that was cool it was weird i was just looking at some pictures and i found pictures from when we went to comic-con last which was 2008 like the picture i had a picture of a girl wearing the the fancy layer cake dress that uh oh the kaylee wears the kaylee wears and i had the picture of like the guy who was dressed as lockjaw or whatever that he-man guy was trapjaw trapjaw yes picture of a bunch of people standing around in the uh lobby dressed as uh steampunk guys no no they were dressed rapists ninjas no that's what everyone is dressed dressed as rapists um they were (laughs) dressed they were dressed as predators oh okay like these really intense predator costumes like full-on mask and everything i believe schwarzenegger also said get to the chopper (laughs) because somebody told him to (sighs) ah Maybe that's what it takes to be a politician. Yeah, know? maybe. Is that you have to be like, okay, I'll say it again. If that's how he raised me. all the uh, money for his campaign was going places, saying things like that to people for donations. All right, we're back on. Tell us more about Comic-Con. Okay, so like I was saying last time, there are all these presentations for movies. And a lot of people hate that about Comic-Con because it used to be a small thing for comic book fans that read comics and didn't get to have sex to get together and no wait let me rephrase they <laughs> got together and form a human centipede <laughs> would be a human millipede i think at this point <laughs> but back in those days yeah it was just a human insect <laughs> they were so small the, sometimes it made it to arachnid it was size. a human spider but just in the last few years Hollywood has come in and, you know, there'll be a presentation about this and they'll fly over a bunch of celebrities and they'll show brand new footage from a movie that nobody's seen before. And it's not just comic book movies. It's just sci-fi stuff or whatever it might be. You know, it's not not even that anymore. I mean, uh, just anything that like you were saying, you tried to get into the community panel and didn't make it in community is a very nerd centric show, you could say, but it's not sci-fi it's not fan it's just comedy and much more so they have every year now don't they a castle panel yeah this year they castle didn't. is just a mystery show i mean it's it's nothing else it does not really belong at comic-con at all and yet they do it there all the same uh, like, and those are always really really fun have you been to a castle panel i don't think so i think the last time i've been there was before castle started up but it's had like three seasons and it's been four years since I went. Nathan Fillion is really, really good with the fans and he yeah. always puts on a show and he always says fun things and he knows how to work a room. If he weren't so darn handsome, he might have been a stand up comic. And I don't know, maybe in college he was. But do they have stand up comedy in Canada? I don't know. They, they, it's, they're so far behind. It's still called vaudeville. <laughs> there. But anyhow, yeah, this year, you're right. They did stuff like that. They had a panel for End of Watch, which is the Jake Gyllenhaal, like found footage cop training day type movie. And they had a panel for The Campaign, which is the Will Ferrell, Zach Galifianakis movie that's that's coming out soon. It's just, you know, whatever the movie studios happen to have to plug and the stars are willing to come out. And and that to me is neat. There was something that they were supposed to do this year that canceled at the last minute. And so there was a huge hole in the Hall H Saturday schedule. And instead of filling it with trailers like they intended to do, they were going to do two, a two-hour block of trailers. Um, they just let the panels before it go long. Which was fine because there's always tons more people wanting to ask questions. Yeah, that's a good idea. But to ensure that I didn't miss out on Hall H. I set my alarm for 3.30 a.m. this year. And I got up and... That was before you went to bed, though, wasn't (laughs) it? I mean, huh? (laughs) I don't think I've ever seen you sign off of the instant messenger before that before. So were you sitting there beside your your bed and all of a sudden your alarm goes off and you're like, oh, crap, 
I should have gone to bed earlier because it's time to get up. <laughs> no, yeah, I was pretty exhausted from all the walking and, right. and you know, taking things to the car and then coming back. You know, that takes an hour. Right. There is parking, but but it's $30 a day. And that's so much money to park your car that, you know, I've always parked my car somewhere off miles away where it's right. free. Or and, and when I first started, you, I would put it at a meter and every two hours or whatever, I would come and, and have to feed the meter. But I just can't. I don't do that anymore. I, you, you miss stuff that way. And I found out, you know, before four o'clock in the morning, you can park anywhere. There's tons of parking spots just right there by the convention center. And so that's the benefit of getting up so bloody early. It was really, really humid in San Diego. They said it was 83% humidity like Friday or Thursday or one of the nights when I watched the news that night. And so the, it was weird because there was like a mist in the pre-dawn and, and it looked neat. It was like there was a fog around the, the convention center. You got closer to the uh, convention center and realized that was just the funk rising <laughs> off the people that were in line early. <laughs> See, it's fun to make fun of the fat and, and unclean, but we've all been there because there's no yeah. way you can go shower or anything like that. And we've both been fat. Yes. And you still, not anymore. You, you're you remembering those halcyon days still, when still, we were fat. Still fairly so. I'm still on my way down, hopefully. But uh, I went over there and there were already just hundreds of people that had just camped out. They had brought tents or they had brought sleeping bags or they had brought cots or, you know, whatever it might be. And they had slept there to ensure that they wouldn't miss the Hall H stuff. And maybe we should do that next time. We won't bother with the hotel room. We'll just sleep in line every night. Oh, can you imagine the smell? <laughs> I mean, with my socks. At the end of each day, you know, they would be like yellow. Oh, They're so horrible from, you know, from dead skin and from, you know, just from sweat. Not, from not going to the bathroom because you're in line. You don't want to lose your place. So you just let it run down your leg. <laughs> See, that's something, too, that I got up at 3.30 in the morning and I went and I got in line at 4. And I didn't go back to my room, I mean, back to my motel until 8 o'clock at night. And I hadn't gone to the bathroom the whole day. And I thought, wow, is that, that's, I guess I was so dehydrated. Yeah, you probably sweat out all your water, so you were unable to make pee. Yeah, anyhow, it it came out like mustard when I finally peed. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. Yikes. But (laughs) that's the thing with Hall H, is it's so hard to get into it. That once you're there, you got to stay. You got you because in the first time that I did that and showed up early in the morning, there were panels first thing and then there were panels way at the end of the night. And I considered getting up and leaving and going to see the rest of the convention and going to eat and all that stuff. But I realized that it, once I left, the line would begin anew and I wouldn't have the advantage of getting there before everybody else in the morning anymore. So if I were wise, I'd make a and I did do this last year. I made a bunch of peanut butter sandwiches and they were in my backpack. So I got to eat them during the day. This year, I didn't think of doing that. And so I was forced to eat the food there. You know, it was like a $14 worst pizza pizza you've ever had in your life. <laughs> oh, it really was. I, I'm no exaggeration. I've had pizza where instead of tomato sauce, they put ketchup on it. And instead of like pepperoni or whatever, they cut circular pieces of tomato so it looks like pepperoni, and it wasn't as bad as the pizza they had at the convention center. But the line was super, super long, even when I first got there. And the reason was that people, they were laying down and they were sleeping and, and, and you know, they weren't packed together like sardines. They were spaced out and they had like aisles empty uh, for fire laws, which is weird because it's 83% humidity and it's in the middle of the night and you're right next to the ocean. But, you know, fire laws are good. And so people were super spaced out. And when <laughs> and some of them were on drugs, so they were extra spaced out. I, you know, whatever gets you through the day. <laughs> it turned out that once people like stood up instead of laying down and being spread out, that line just it moved three whole blocks when that time came. But the line went down behind the convention center all the way down the sidewalk to the marina which is alongside the ocean and that's where i sat down and spent hours there from until about 7 30 
Uh, but getting to know these people that are around me and that, and, and they were cool. They were fun and, the, and and interesting. The guys behind me didn't care about comic books at all. They just liked the movie stuff. And the people in front of me, they had come from L.A., and they had each gone to their different panels and were talking about it for hours about what they saw in the Game of Thrones panel or they saw in the Big Bang Theory panel or whatever it is. And, and these were cool people. I don't know. I think that these tend to be cooler people just because they're similar in passions. So once the line started to move, because uh, security came through and said at eight o'clock, we're going to line up and tighten up the lines and the fire law lines are going to be no longer in use and so take all of your bedding and your sleeping bags and all that stuff back to your cars or your hotels or whatever before eight o'clock but for hours i just had to sit there and get to know the people around me and i blogged a little bit and i tried to sleep and at about 4 30 the sprinklers went off that were just right there and people were getting sprayed and you know, luckily I hadn't fallen asleep yet. And so I didn't get sprayed and we all just moved, you know, farther onto the sidewalk. But at that point, after that scare, I wasn't tired anymore, which is weird, but you know how that is. Adrenaline yeah. will wake you up. And yet when you're driving down the road and you start to fall asleep and you nearly crash your car and kill everyone inside it, that should completely wake you up. But 45 seconds later, you're falling asleep again. Yeah. How is that possible? Anyway, sorry. Topic for another night. Once I got in there at Hall H, I, I was in a really, really good spot, better than I'd ever been before, despite it looking like there were thousands of people in line in front of me. But the other thing was the people just kept coming and coming and coming behind coming me. Coming and coming. No, that was, the, that was before. <laughs> Mr. Schwarzenegger, tell us what it feels like to work out. All right, I'd love to tell this one. And they just kept lining up and, and they went all the way down the marina and looped around and came all the way back to the marina. And then they they started in, all, I kid you not, the shoreline. And to the point where the people in front of me said, the end of the line is only for people with kayaks now. <laughs> but as far as the eye could see. You must have a breathing tank <laughs> to be at the end of the line. And I, I started to worry because like when the sun came up, and there were still just masses of people coming. I thought, these people got here before the sun came up, and I don't think they're going to get in. That's not fair. That's not, that's bad planning. Or that's, that's, it's just not right that this many people, the vast majority of people, don't get to go in there, don't get to see this stuff. That only the few, the 1%, if you will, get to have all of, okay, I promised myself I wouldn't do that. We've talked about it. They need rooms where they just show what's going on in Hall H on the TV so that people can see it. And, and you know, you don't have to be in there. I would be perfectly content for most things to be in another room and just be able to see what yeah, it is. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, when you're in Hall H, for the most part, that's way, the way you see it. You're so far away often that you can't, I mean, the people are specs. It's like having the nosebleed seat at the concert or whatever. You can't really see hannah montana doing her dance you see it on the big screen and that's the way you see it as though you were watching it at home so why the hell did you come in the first place but uh, that would be fine i would think i don't know if they have rooms elsewhere that would work for that i mean that convention center and it's probably one of the biggest there is i know the convention center in our town has various conventions and at work we're always doing stories about how this convention is threatening to leave and go to some other city. Because it's too small? Yeah, if we don't improve the convention center in this way and build more hotels, and etc. So I don't know if there's a place larger than that. I mean, you would think maybe L.A. would have places like that or New York or something would have big convention center type facilities. Chicago, wow, I don't know. Can you imagine but... trying to park in New York? But yeah, I don't know if those oh. towns are even big convention places. It seems more like you go to a convention in a town like San Diego, maybe L.A., because that's the kind of place somebody would want to go to a convention in. Like Miami or places like that is where people want to go for a convention. New Orleans, I don't know uh, if actual big cities have big convention centers or not. I mean, there can't be one much bigger than what they have in San Diego. Maybe what they need to do is have like a remote place you can go to san diego or you can go to new orleans and you can see it all and they have some things in both places and all the other things are simulcast 
via satellite to the other places i don't know but yeah i I totally know what you mean man it's just it sucks because like you were saying last time you were one of those people for the firefly thing the second the door opened you went straight for the line and you didn't have a snowball's chance of getting in and that made me more sympathetic to all these people that were coming and coming and you know they were tired and they were you know they had they hadn't gotten as good a parking spot as i had but yet they'd still gotten there at seven in the morning or six in the morning or some, to me, ungodly hour, you know, 10 in the morning is just, wow, can't even imagine. And yet they weren't going to get in. And that I knew how that felt. And I don't like, I'm not one of those guys that's like, ah, F you. It just, ew, that's, that's too bad. And they have spread out into like the Marriott and stuff like that that's nearby. And now there are panels there and things like that. But it's just, it's too big. And part of it is... That there's the comic book aspect and then there's the movie aspect. And at some point, they're probably going to have to split that. Right. And then Comic-Con will go back to the way it was. And, and the movie con. is going to just be horrible. But Hall H is the great big hall that holds thousands of people where they have the big movie studio presentations. And just I eat that stuff up. I don't, I don't know why, but because I love movies and I love those kind of movies and that. And so I got to see some cool stuff and and I'm just going to skip over the things that I didn't care about because, you know, there's limited amount of time, but there were three panels that I was really looking forward to in hall H that day. And they were the Hobbit man of steel and iron man three and man of steel was first, but I mean, they had other stuff like Pacific rim is a Guillermo del Toro movie that comes out next year. It's a Kaiju movie. (laughs) A daikaiju? Oh, yeah. Uh, Man of Steel is the Christopher Nolanification of Superman that comes out next year. And wow, I, I could not have been more negatively affected by the presentation and by the footage that we saw. I just, it, it was not for me. It, it rubbed me the wrong way. It, it got my goat. In fact, <laughs> maybe we'll just do an episode where I talk about what I didn't like about the Man of Steel stuff so that you can all go your, your merry way today. But you saw the teaser at the beginning of Dark Knight, and we saw a great deal more of that. But if you didn't see the S at the end, would you have known that, that what that was? Did it look like Superman to you? They did have the one little bit on the teaser where he's flying around, and you see a little poofy sound barrier breaks or whatever those were supposed to be as he flies. I guess you would assume that was Superman. The S at the end doesn't look like Superman's symbol. It's all foobar it's too busy and you yeah. know, too armory and stuff. I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I'll talk to you in depth about that. Cause Oh gosh, I've got so many issues I wanted to discuss and <laughs> about who Superman is and, and why I don't think it works to do this Superman begins interpretation of the character where you just wash away all of the mythic underpinnings and, and trying to make it about a man. But then, oh, there, was, but then there was the what of steel. steel. Ah, yeah, See what well, he did there? Uh, there? There's a teaser for you. Watch Gets My Goat. Yes, yeah, so, sometime in November. And uh, you'll hear it later. Uh, then there was the Hobbit panel. And holy cow, I reacted the complete barometer opposite of that. I just ate up the Hobbit thing. I loved it, man. Peter Jackson came out. Martin Freeman came out. And Andy Serkis came out. And Sir Ian McKellen came out. And uh, Elijah Wood was in the audience just as a fan and they're like, oh, Elijah, come on up. And, and he got to sit down next to him. And I am so anticipating this movie. I mean, it's all because of the Lord of the Rings films. In the Hobbit, I did read as a child, but it was never something that stuck with me or inspired me or anything. I, the Rankin-Bass cartoon of The Hobbit was much more my style than the book ever was. And it looks like everything that I loved about the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies but a sequel <laughs> right. kind of thing. And, you know, that we got to see Legolas in there and Galadriel in there and Saruman in there and, and old Bilbo and, and, and Frodo. And they, they've done everything that they possibly can to let you know this is part of the Lord of the Rings. All right. right. Don't, don't let the crazy title confuse you, which is just so strange. But I guess there's way more people that have seen the movies than will ever read a book. Right. And so there's that. But I was really moved by a scene that they showed with Galadriel and Gandalf, where Gandalf is sort of questioning his abilities and his own wisdom. And I was just like, wow, that's so not Gandalf the White. It was a very human side to him. And maybe that's exactly the problem I had with Man of Steel, 
but I don't have a problem with Gandalf being humanized. And yet Gandalf is still a wizard. And so, yeah, I, I can't wait to see that. And I, I you know, hope that you anticipate it as much as, as I do and, and that it's as good as what they promised in that footage. Yeah, the trailer that they showed before Dark Knight was really, really cool. I don't know. I got really excited. I think there was something about the part where they're showing you all the stuff and then they stop and all the dwarves are singing their song. And then it goes into the stuff from there with the song going, gosh, that was just good. It's one of the best trailers I've ever seen. And I've seen thousands of trailers probably. And one of the problems that I've always had with those four books are the songs where the songs will continue for two or three pages. And I'll just like, none of this is important. None of this is useful. F this. And yet I really responded to that song that the dwarves sing And yeah, that the trailer would just be so bold as to take 45 seconds or whatever and not show explosions and CGI rockets and all this stuff, which probably shouldn't be in a Hobbit movie, (laughs) but and to just show this moment, it's just for tone. And that's neat. Probably tells us a lot more about what the Hobbit movie is going to be than tons of really quickly spliced images. Right. Yeah, we'll see that. You know, it comes out in Christmas time, and there's two of them. And somebody said at one point the first movie ends, and I I won't spoil that because I don't think that's something that they're supposed to have put out there. But uh, yeah, oh gosh, it looks cool. When and, does the second one come out? Is it Christmas of year, next year? Yeah, it's a okay. year later to like the week, which I loved. Wasn't that such a cool thing of knowing that you had a Lord of the Rings movie to go see each year just for those brief three years? But it was something to anticipate. Yeah. Well, well, like when I was a kid, there would be like a Halloween movie every Halloween or Friday the 13th every Few year Friday that had a Friday the 13th in it. Yeah. And, I think and there's like three Friday the 13th this year. Oh, thank goodness. Really? Oh, thank, Isn't that crazy? Thank Lucifer or whoever is behind <laughs> Friday the 13th. Uh, and they did that with the Saw movies for like five years in a row. Every Halloween there would be a Saw movie. And, I, you know, I didn't embrace the Saw movies as I did the other things, but... I like that. I like the idea of a tradition kind of thing. Yeah, it was that way with Harry Potter for a while, too. Every Christmas or every Thanksgiving or whatever, you had one and then got to the point where they couldn't manage or whatever. And so it started spreading out a little more and more like every year and a half you got one every two years now. And If you could do something less epic than Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or something like that, you could keep it up for a long, long time. You know, a new Dracula movie every Thanksgiving for some reason yeah it's much more of a thanksgiving type story well you know what i'm saying yeah you feast on the blood of the mortals and yeah there you go you fixed my problem Uh, okay and so at the end of the long procession of panels was the iron man 3 but it was the marvel studios panel and thank goodness they had one last year they didn't even though the year before, Joss Whedon had brought out like the Avengers for 45 seconds or whatever and let us applaud. And then he says, we'll see you next Comic-Con. You know, we're going to have a whole panel dedicated to the Avengers. And then they didn't because Disney didn't want to promote it. They had their own convention a month later in which they wanted to do Avengers then. Would you go to that Dis- D23 convention? You, you like Disney a lot, right? Sure. I don't know what the convention is like. I haven't really heard a lot about it, but if they're doing Avengers panels and stuff, then... It's probably a lot of Mary Poppins sing-alongs. I bet they have Phineas and Ferb panel. I would imagine you're right. You probably get to meet Dan Povemeyer and Swampy Marsh in that one. All right. (laughs) Uh, So the Marvel Studios thing was neat because they... The first thing they brought out, a person they brought out, he's not a thing. He's, he's a good, good, good It's not guy. the thing? So it was, wasn't the thing that no, they brought out? No, that's, that's right. It was man thing. <laughs> oh, good. So and you know what? Thing? In person, giant size. Oh, my gosh. They brought out Edgar Wright, and he's the guy that did uh, Shaun of the Dead and uh, Hot Fuzz. You've seen those two, right? Mm-hmm. If not, he's, go rush out and see those the- movies director or what? he's the, the director yeah oh, okay and he for years has been attached to write and direct an ant-man movie and uh there's still nothing what they the? brought him out and said ant-man by the way is not gonna happen so you can uh-huh. keep on walking off the other end of the stage sir well it was it was weird because it did seem kind of pointless to bring him out because they showed footage 
from the very first time Marvel Studios had done a panel, and I guess it was 2006 when they were announcing that, you know, we're going to do Iron Man and Robert Downey Jr. is going to be Tony Stark. Woohoo, cool. And they had him there that year, 2006, saying, oh, my name's Edgar Wright, and I'm going to be directing Ant-Man someday. And then here it is all these years later, and he still hasn't done it. But what he had done was he had done a test reel for the studio to show them what Ant-Man was going to look like. And they showed that to us. And he has like the big helmet. And uh, I don't know. I thought it was neat. And then they showed the logo, you know, Marvel Studios Ant-Man. But he didn't have a release date or anything like that. And they're like, hey, thank you, Edgar. Next. And so I did kind of wonder what the point of that was, except for maybe to gauge our reaction to it or... I. I don't know. In retrospect, I I wish that we had been allowed to ask more questions because they really only had question and answer for Iron Man 3. But I wanted to know, what is the problem with Ant-Man? Why has that not gone forward? And the movie that they announced recently, there was a mystery movie. Remember, there was a Marvel movie that had a release date, but no title. And they announced that it's Guardians of the Galaxy, which is a superhero team of a bunch of aliens, pretty much. And each alien is like the last of their species. And they're like a super space cops kind of the the Green Lantern Corps for the Marvel Universe kind of thing. And I've never read a Guardians of the Galaxy comic in my life. They're obscure. And I just wondered, well, why that? What is it about Guardians of the Galaxy that makes you say that's the one we're doing next? That's the next standalone movie. And is it because the script turned out way better than they thought it would be? Is it because there's some board and they vote on what's going to get their money next? Is it? I don't know. But it looks like it's not going to be a cheap film. And yet nobody knows any of these characters. I mean, maybe there are legions of Rocket Raccoon fans out there. But this is me shrugging. I realize it's, it's audio. I don't know. Had you ever heard of Guardians of the Galaxy? A scale from 1 to 10, how much do you love Rocket Raccoon? I've heard of Guardians of Gahul, but not Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> But uh, 10, I love Rocket Raccoon. The Whoever voices that character. Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Oh, Rocky which, the which, Flying Squirrel. Okay. Whichever one you're actually talking about, I love them both. <laughs> but they announced the titles of the Thor sequel and the Captain America sequel. Do they have titles or are they just Thor 2? Uh, I believe Thor 2 is called Thor the Dark World. Okay. Does that sound right? I don't know. That's cool. I like that they did that. They've yeah. given up on that whole Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3, although they did that with Iron Man, didn't they, Iron Man yeah, 2? Yeah, they did. And Captain America is Captain America colon the Winter Soldier, mm. which I think is a neat title. And the audience just went, ooh, just like you did when they announced that because those who know what the Winter Soldier is know and know what you're in for. And I hope that they do a really good job on that because... Uh, that was a really cool... Can I just spoil that for a second? Or, or is it not cool to spoil who the Winter Soldier is? Well, we're going to spoil who the Winter Soldier is. For those of you who don't know, you can <laughs> skip ahead now. In comic lore, there was the idea that nobody stays dead in comic books, except for two people, Uncle Ben Parker and Bucky. Bucky Barnes, the young sidekick of Captain America, because their death served a very important purpose. And, you know, obviously Spider-Man wouldn't be who he is if Uncle Ben hadn't died the way that he did or the way that he does in Amazing Spider-Man. And Bucky showed that Captain America had a price that he paid and that he failed. He had something on his shoulders always, a burden of, I lost this kid who was my responsibility and it haunted him for years and years and also for years and years there was the attempt the thought of let's bring bucky back how do we bring bucky back what what would happen if bucky came back and somebody ed brubaker this this comic writer finally brought bucky back and they said okay he was rescued by the russians uh he was left for dead but he didn't die and the Russians took him and they mind wiped him. What do you call it? Brainwashed him and turned him into an assassin. And all these years later, Captain America runs into Bucky alive, but as a villain. And, and I don't know if I 
sold it as cool as that turned out to be, but it really turned out to be cool. It was really, really well done. And so you, they, the way that they killed Bucky in the Captain America movie um, left plenty of room for that, for bringing him back as Winter Soldier um, because, you know, we didn't have a body and we didn't have, you know, a definitive this guy is dead moment. And so, I, you know, I think that that'll be neat. Yeah. Anyhow, the vast majority of the panel was Iron Man 3. Does Iron Man 3 have a title or is it just Iron Man 3? It's just Iron Man 3. Yeah, I suppose they started that precedent and can't unstart it now, huh? Right. And Robert Downey Jr. was there and he's just a giant attention whore. <laughs> uh, he is Tony Stark. And that's the weird thing is there's, there's no line where Tony Stark ends and he becomes the real Robert Downey Jr. Because I've seen him in panels and things for like Sherlock Holmes and other stuff. And he's Tony Stark. And, and you know what? Maybe that's that's cool casting uh, or, you know, inspired who is like Tony Stark, Robert Downey Jr. is. Oh, let's, let's cast him as this part. But anyhow, he came out and he had the arc. What do you call it? No, he had the repulsor thing on his hand, the light and that. And he was waving pe- at people and he had music blaring. And he came <laughs> through the crowd instead of from the front of the stage. So he walked through thousands of people and was given five. And he had sunglasses on the whole time. I don't know the way that he was in at the beginning of Iron Man two. He's like, Hey, everybody love me. Look at the girl's boobs. He's right here. That's how he was at, at every time I've seen him. And, and we love it. I don't know. There's something about it. It wouldn't work if Chris Evans came out or Thor came out like that, but it works for him. Yeah. He just puts shoot to thrill on and comes out or it, it was something it was, I think it was a black exploitation. Wasn't ACDC. It, it wasn't very white, but uh, cc winans or something I, I, what theme, theme from, from yeah it was something like that you know but anyhow uh, he came out and they had uh don Cheadle come out who is uh war machine. war machine good job shane black came out and he's the the new writer director and uh, and then john favreau came out because he is executive producer now and he mm-hmm. also plays happy hogan who's the driver the oh really that's the john personal favreau? assistant to tony stark and in, in both movies. He's yeah. the one that fights the one guy right. while she's fighting like 20 guys. And, and one of the best moments in that whole second yeah. film. I didn't realize that was John Favreau. I have no idea what he looks like or anything. Fat. Yes, apparently so. <laughs> I'm sorry. But he was talking about how great it was to be the executive producer and not the director. And, and you, you know, George Lucas talked about that when, you know, he stepped back and didn't have to direct the second Star Wars movie. Just you still have power and the people still have to do what you say, but you're not in the trenches and getting your hands dirty and, you know, suffering through every single mundane detail of the movie. Was uh, Gwyneth Paltrow there? No, no women allowed at (laughs) Comic-Con, as it should be, because they're they're too distracting. But they showed us some footage. And again, uh, it's okay to spoil things, right? Do you care? I suppose not. They showed Pretend this. Pretend as though I was there with you. Okay. Well, you remember when they showed the footage. <laughs> Usually at these things, they put together a reel just for us. And sometimes they'll release this footage later as a trailer. But in this case, you know, it's just, it's, it's much more for the fans. But they showed like what's going on in the movie. And they set up Guy Pierce. Do you know who Guy Pierce is? He's an actor as the main bad guy in this new movie. Uh, and yet there's this voice that keeps narrating while it's going on and, you know, talking about how Tony Stark pretends to be this hero or whatever, but, you know, he sees nothing. And I had no idea whose voice this was because we didn't see anybody speaking this whole time. It was, you know, it was just a narrator saying in a world. And basically we see Tony Stark come against another, like, industrialist, that has all sorts of technology and he, uh, you know, is taking him down or whatever. And then his mansion in L.A. is attacked and destroyed and sinks into the, the ocean, falls off the cliff or whatever. And and then they show this guy that's talking. And the first thing you see are his hands 
and he's got rings on every finger. And then the camera pulls up and it's Sir Ben Kingsley as the Mandarin. And he looks like the Mandarin. He's got the black beard and, you know, the long black hair or whatever. And sort of Eurasian features, you know, that's the weird thing about Ben Kingsley is he played Gandhi and he plays a Brit and he plays an American and because he's multiracial. I I, I don't know what the deal (laughs) is, but it was the Mandarin who is the arch nemesis of Iron Man, who we've never seen up to this point and has, they've always told us is impossible to do. We even had a discussion about it. It's impossible to do because of his name or his ethnicity or whatever. I I don't know. But what Kingsley has chosen to do, and Shane Black talked about this in the panel, is he chose to give him an American accent because I guess it takes the stink off of a character called the Mandarin. You know, it's like there's no more accusations of racism because, listen, he doesn't speak like Charlie Chan. (laughs) <laughs> and I just that pissed me off so much. But at the same time, if that's the price you have to pay to get Mandarin in your Iron Man movie, then fine, that's cool. But the the more important thing is that he looked like the Mandarin. You know, you if you had ever read an Iron Man comic book, you knew who that was. And they didn't say in the footage, but just the audience just went, ah, you know, when they saw who this guy was. And that's cool. I, I, hopefully they're not going to kill him off. Or whatever, you know, they've, they've got plans for many more Iron Man movies. I, I don't know. Because somebody asked J- Downey Jr. about the... Uh, somebody asked Robert about the contract that he had. Because they said, you know, you were signed to do three films. And you've done three. You did Iron right. Man and Iron Man 2 and The Avengers. And he's like, no, no, no. The Avengers is a different contract. You know, it, it wasn't part of it. The three films were these three Iron Man movies. And they said, so what about the future? What, are you, are you, what about Iron Man 4, 5 through 10 or whatever? And he says, well, uh, it depends on the size of Brink's truck they drive up to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a very Tony Stark kind of thing to, to say. He's, be, he's absorbed this character into himself. But I was really excited about it. It looks like it's a cool movie. And, and then granted, it was all action stuff that they showed us. And at the Hobbit panel... They showed us all like character stuff. Like we saw riddles in the dark and we got to see, you know, what has it got in its pockets? And to me, that was so cool. Whereas, you know, another part of me thought seeing Tony's house blow up and seeing him fight guys and stuff was cool. But the Hobbit thing was the highlight of the day for me, not the Iron Man thing. Although I did really, really dig the Mandarin reveal. But maybe that's just because I'm getting older and we've talked about it a million times. There's only so many explosions. There's only so many CG robots or whatever it is that you can see before you say, you know, I've seen all that. Right. It's done. But you still respond to human things, to frailty, to fear, to love, to triumph, to despair. These these emotional things that will continue, I'm assuming – Until you're an old, old man, they will continue to affect you. I don't know. Ask me again in 40 years. I'm sorry, dig me up in 40 years and (laughs) consult a Ouija board in 40 years. Anyhow, after that, Kevin Smith came out. He always ends the Hall H thing. And, you know, he always is super, super vulgar. I think he gets off on seeing shocked reactions from people, you know, because he'll always comment that somebody has a little kid up on the third row or whatever, and it just heard me talking about felching or whatever kind of super vulgar thing you shouldn't be talking about in front of a third grader. But last year, remember how inspired I was by what Kevin Smith talked yeah. about? Because he was talking about being done with filmmaking and doing the things that he liked to do now, because why not? Remember, he kept saying, yeah, why not? And he that, wished he had more of those people around him that would say, why not, instead of why. And that stuck with me. I still say, why not, sometimes at the end of episodes, because it resonated. It was like he had directed that to me. And this year, he was talking about he's in his 40s now, and there are fewer years ahead than behind. And so he's even more in that mindset of I'm not going to do stuff that I don't want to do anymore. And now he's in a position where he can do that, a financial position where he can choose to do whatever he wants because he's got money. And I guess if you made movies or whatever, you continue to get checks for those that you did in the past and you could stop and just live off of what you did in the past. And to me, that's awesome. 
be like if you won the lottery and instead of choosing the big sum, you choose the little payments thing, which is the way to go. Because how many people have you heard? You know, he's like, I won six million dollars. Eight years later, I was broke. But this year, Kevin was just talking about his podcasting and how much he loves to podcast and smoking pot and how much he loves that and getting together with his friends and just talking and how much he loves that. And he's got a fan base that is willing to pay him to sit in a room and talk or to sit with his friends and podcast and talk. That to me was really, really cool because that's something that you and I do. And and I now we've slowed down or life has made us slow down. I don't know. Is, is yeah, it by choice? It's not so much by choice, really. But if there was a way that we could do this as a job, we wouldn't slow down. We would speed up. And that's something that he has done is, you know, he has all of these shows and all, and, you know, like a schedule of things. And he's got a channel, the Smodcast radio network or whatever it is on Sirius or something like that, where he's just paid to continue doing these things that he loves. And he kept drilling that into the audience you know people would with a kevin smith panel you've been to one before yeah yeah i saw zach and miri make a porno panel yeah that's right there's only five or six questions that get asked in his two-hour presentation because he'll talk for a half hour on one question and he'll tangentially tell stories and go back to this and oh one more thing i did this one time and oh okay when i was a teenager this is my sexual experiences and Sorry about the six-year-old right there that's taking notes. And he did that in this. But every time somebody would ask a question, it would somehow come back to that, to there are fewer years ahead than behind. And so you got to find what you love and you've got to do that. And if you can find a way to make money doing that, then you have won. Then hold on to that tight and don't let anybody tell you that you're wasting your time or that this is worthless or that this is stupid or grow up. These are powerful words for creative people or for people that are still looking at where, where should I go? What should I do? What choices should I make? And anyhow, every year since you stopped coming with me, I, I, there's a tradition of calling you at the end of the Hall H presentation and telling you what I saw. And last year, I remember just being so psyched up about this Kevin Smith, why not thing? And like a list of things that we were going to do by gum when I came back from San Diego. <laughs> and by golly. And Begora. <laughs> and this year, I wasn't quite as pumped up. And the reason is, at the very end of the panel, he told this really depressing story about something that Bruce Willis did that was uncool when they were on the set of Cop Out. And I'm not going to reiterate the story because I don't want to bum anybody out. I just I wish that he had skipped that story and just ended on the high note of find what you love. Find a way to make money doing what you love. If you hate what you do, get out. Or find a way to spend as little time as possible doing what you hate so that you can focus on what you love. And it's elementary, really. Everybody should realize that. It's nothing new. But it's just neat to hear him impart wisdom because he's so immature and so potty mouthed and all that stuff, you know, but he seems like a slacker, a perennial man child, but he's lived and he's had failures and disappointments. And I've never been to a panel post Jersey girl where he didn't bring up Jersey girl. And I know that that was just a terrible experience for him where he made the best movie that he could and forces outside of his movie making crushed that and made sure that it didn't get to be who he wanted to be because people hated Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez and because of Geely and all that, you know what I mean? And he always mentions that, but it was a lesson that he learned. It was something that, you know, and this cop-out movie that he made where he's like, okay, I'm going to make a movie that I didn't write for the money to be a big time movie maker and all this stuff. And it's going to, and it was horrible. And I guess he had tons of studio problems and problems with the actors and all that stuff. And he's like, oh, F it. I'm never going to do that again. I don't care. However much they paid him wasn't worth it to him because it took away his freedom and his autonomy and his voice, he feels like. And you haven't seen Cop Out, right? No. But if you saw it, you would be shocked to see directed by Kevin Smith at the end. Whether you like his voice or not, he's definitely got a voice and it's absent in that movie. Anyhow, 
I used to go to motivational seminars, you know, the Tony Robbins kind of thing. When I lived in LA, I tried to motivate or have somebody motivate or, you know, you sit there and you have somebody say, get off your duff and go do things. And the charge that you sometimes got, depending on the speaker from those, is what I have gotten from Kevin Smith's pep talks in a way. And he was just talking about how he keeps getting these job offers and people that want to pay him to do these podcasts or to film his podcast or to do a show or whatever. And he's like, okay, but I would do that anyway. You know, he hit the lottery in a way with clerks because there's no way that that should have made a career. As much as I like clerks, it's a fluke. It's an aberration. It's a one in a million thing. And But he continues to hit the lottery. And sometimes it's fun to hear somebody say, you know, that I hit the lottery yeah. three times in a row. And this is what I he learned. He took this the annual I payment instead of the lump sum he did. <laughs> and he's he's so geek friendly and so self-effacing that there was a woman in the line and she told him first and foremost, you know, I don't like your movies and I don't like your potty humor and your and she actually said potty, which tells you who this woman was. I maybe her kids had dragged her to the panel or whatever. Why she was there, I I don't know. Do you want to hear the word cock a thousand times in 2 hours? But I really like that you the things that you have to say about that, you know, you seem like a, a level-headed guy and, and you seem smart. And and so I just wanted to say that. And he's like, what was your question? No, th that's it. And he just, he laughed and he's like, well, thank you though. You know, And she reminded him of his mom and his mom would always be like, I love you and you're my son and all that. But you know, what you think is funny and what you do as entertainment, you know, I can't get behind. And so I guess he's had that his whole life. And this is the last thing I'll say. He talked about discovering the internet and message boards and all that when they first came into existence and how he would spend hours getting on there and, and arguing with people that said that your movie sucked or you suck or you're stupid or you're, you know, and he'd have to tell them how they're wrong and all that stuff. And then one day he realized I'm wasting all this time with that and I'm never going to convince these people. Uh, so I'm going to ignore that kind of stuff. The Kevin Smith sucks threads. I'm not even going to read them. I'm just going to Go to the Rick McCallums of the world that they say that I'm great and I'm going to interact with that. And that struck a nerve with me. I hate it when people say that I'm sexist or, or I'm backward or my show isn't as good as it could be or that there's somebody on this planet of six billion people does a better Sean Connery impression than I do. No, they don't. I, I like to be <laughs> around the people that say that they really liked our show or that they laughed at so-and-so joke or whatever. And so, you know, that spoke to me as well. You know, just put that out of your mind. Don't bother getting on there and saying, I'm not sexist because, you know, whatever. Just like go on to the next thing. And I don't know. I haven't learned to do that yet. But once again, you know, something that Kevin Smith's trying to impart his fountain of wisdom <laughs> on i don't know what people think that people that don't like kevin smith they're like why are you yeah, yeah but somebody was telling me about something inspiring that glenn beck said on his show maybe i'd be the same way but just like ah. <laughs> but we each respond to different things and a fat guy in a little who, coat oh, in sorry. a little coat a fat guy in a, a hockey jersey who named his daughter after a batman villain is just right up my alley and he speaks my language so there's that all right. Well, there's your annual Kevin Smith inspirational story. We still say why not to everybody. Why not do what you love? Like you said, there are people that will say why do that. Why waste your time? Why write that story? Why send that story to FNSF when they're just going to reject it? Instead, you should be with somebody who's like, dude, this was a good story. Why not? See if they'll buy it. That's right. And that's why I got so excited about it last year. And I forget these things. You you yeah. have to ask yourself why not so many times. You do. Yeah. It's the Doonstief motto. We even have t-shirts that you can buy. Do we really? Yeah. It says why not write on it with a little orange D. But we don't get any money for that, right? No, we don't. But okay, they're so, so fun. Donate to the show and then also buy a t-shirt. Yeah, if you want one. If you want one, yeah. T-shirt's optional. Donating to the show is, is more. Yeah, much that's more kind of mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Back to your regularly scheduled episode. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. So I guess that's quite enough of that. <laughs> Hopefully, this episode actually hits air, hits web 
before the Parsec Awards are awarded. When does that happen? I, it happens at the start of September. Oh, well, of so course we've it got will, then. about a month from the recording time until uh, they're awarded. But we just wanted to mention we received a Parsec, nom- not qu- a nomination, I guess. What we really are, we were named Parsec finalists, I think is the uh, correct term for that, in two different categories. So vote for us. If you have a vote. Wait, well, we don't do that. We don't ask people. We don't say things like, you know, it would really mean something to us to have an actual Parsec award. Instead, I mean, the nominations are great, but it would justify the, the time we've put into the sweat. <laughs> and, and the many times that Dune Steve has almost ended and we've said, OK, well, well, let's just do a couple more episodes and then we'll. OK, a few more after that. All right. We're almost. Done. OK, one more. <laughs> we don't say things like that. That's right. Other podcasts may. And maybe that's why they get the win. No, I don't think. See, the thing is, they're determined by judges. So unless we've got some of the judges listening now, we're we're kind of wasting our breath. Right, and all of the judges are already tied up in that one podcast that got all the nominations. (laughs) So it's going to be awful hard for them to. (laughs) But yeah, we got nominated for best speculative fiction story, large cast, which actually was two categories mashed together into one because they say that if they don't get enough entries into each category to just it's like the the oscars where you know if there's only a certain number of films submitted to be the best animated feature then they'll only have three nominations but if there's more then they'll have five um and that's what the case was with this where there was supposed to be a short version like short story and then a long story version of this and apparently there wasn't enough entries in the long story category so they just shoved that in there and that's why we're up against abigail hilton's book length story gilded cowrie catchers book three ashes the story that uh of ours that got nominated was the ever dreaming verdict of plagues by jason sanford which was Produced by Brian Lincoln. And originally, it's a kind of a strange occurrence. Originally, we thought it was Beachcombing that was nominated for the that category, which seemed kind of weird because Beachcombing was a single narrator, and it seemed weird to have it in the large cast category, although it did have some people eh, talking in the background and stuff. So you were suspicious because of that, or you weren't suspicious because you knew there were people talking in the background? I was just confused because I didn't submit it. Okay, that's that's true. And <laughs> in case people don't know, there is a preliminary round where you can suggest any podcast or any story, sort of something like that. Uh huh. Any listener can nominate, and then the the Parsec board, Jun- yeah, the judges. lets people know that they've gotten a suggestion. I guess it's technically called a nomination, but uh-huh. I don't like that word then it's up to that podcaster or team to put together a presentation to send to the board uh, where they include an introduction and then they include a segment of the story or episode or podcast in question and then send it to them by the deadline. And I guess it's somebody's job to listen through all those. Right. And then they narrow it down in each category and that's what got nominated, right? But we didn't do an introduction and a sample for beachcombing. Right. We had a nomination for beachcombing, one for Asshat Magic Spider, etc. And I just figured it would probably be best for us, unlike last year where we had two nominations in the same category and we wound up winning nothing. I thought it might have backfired on us last year where maybe one of our stories took votes away from the other of our stories and maybe had we only had one then we could have perhaps come away with a win so i thought okay this year we're just going to do one per category and so i said okay there is those voices talking in the background of beachcombing so maybe that might come up as being oh no this one doesn't count as a small cast they consider small cast one or two people right one or two people and that's all and you count in the people that you hear in the background there were several others so just in case i figured okay we've got Asshat Magic Spider was just the two of us, so we put that one for small cast. A much more impressive large cast would be Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plague, so we picked that one for our large cast. And then somehow their spreadsheet never got changed or whatever, and they wound up 
Although they nominated Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plagues, they published that Beachcombing was the one that was nominated. I thought maybe it was possible that Sunny C, who produced Beachcombing, had actually sent them a sample. Although that seemed kind of weird because he did produce it, but it's not his podcast. They usually send it to the people that are in charge of it. So we talked to him about it, and he said he hadn't sent a sample. And then all of a sudden I realized, you know, something's up here. And so I sent him an email because I didn't want him to go sit down to judge beachcombing and find a completely different story. You know, it's, that, that seemed like a sure recipe for also losing. <laughs> so I figured I better make sure it was right. And turns out, yeah, that was they had mixed it up. So Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plagues is the one that was nominated for Best Story Large Cast. So how does that work? They, somebody on that board has to listen to both parts of Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plagues and judge it based on that? Or do they just listen to the sample that we sent that was 20 minutes? Because Abby's is hours and hours and hours long, and it's not even the whole novel. It's a section of the novel. Is somebody going to sit through all that? Yeah, I, what they do is they have this, the smaller samples that, that you give them for the first part where they choose the finalists. And then they just have five finalists, and so I think the judges listen to the entirety of... In the ca- in the case of Ever Dreaming Verdict of Plagues, it's short. It's only an hour and a few minutes, so they can listen to the whole thing. I, I think for Abby's thing, the novel, she had to pick a certain size, and I don't know if she's had to change that now that they folded her category down into ours, and she has to give them a smaller segment of the story or something, but provide them a large sample, and then they they listen to that, I think. And and you did that already? You got both halves of Plague Birds 2 and stuck them together in a file without any of our introduction and extra. I did, yes. I got it on there, and they just need to download it and listen to it. Well, you were on the ball then. Yeah, that's what they tell you to do. You got to have it turned in in time. So we'll see how it goes. But if you look at the large cast thing, you and I participated in book three of Cowrie Catchers, our voices, and then Journey Into, Marshall Latham's podcast, got a nomination for Dream Engine. And you and I did voices on that as well. I think you were the only one that did a voice in that one. But yeah. Oh, is that true? There was a time when I was thinking that I had done a voice in it, but I was wrong. Oh, okay. I had actually done the voice in Hop Frog or whatever it was, which we did at the same time. And so I was a little (sighs) confused. That was, I think, Marshall's first. It was the first thing that we did for his show. I think it actually came up much later in its run, though, once he had it all put together. But uh, yeah, congratulations to Marshall for that and to Abby as well. Geez, there's so many podcasts that got nominated that you and I were friends with the people that did them or we've done voices. Like there's Modeling, I do voices on that. Star Trek Outpost, I do voices on that. The Roundtable podcast obviously got right. a nomination. We did an we interview, were guests on a that. show on that one. Pendragon Variety Show also in that same category as uh, the Roundtable podcast. And that's L. Scribe Harris's? That's, yeah, Scribe Harris's show. And yeah, it's just really interesting to see that. Um, we also got one other nomination that we haven't mentioned yet. We were up for Best Speculative Fiction Magazine. Really? Yeah. Are you sure? Uh-huh. It's hard to believe we have any chance, though, because we're up against the Drabblecast, which I think has won it two years in a row. And we're up against League of Incredible Gentlemen or whatever the crap. What is it called again? Uh, Strange Occurrences. But yeah, we're also up against the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, which seems to be... uh, Should win? Yeah, it has a a nomination in every category or something like that. Sometimes multiple. So it's hard to believe that it's not going to win all of them. But But, yeah, well, that's all right. If Dabblecast manages an upset, that would be kind of neat. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, we we got these nominations. We figured we'd let you guys know. Pretty unlikely that we'll be in Atlanta to accept any awards that might possibly come our way, unfortunately, because it's just a long ways away from where we are. Not driving distance. And I'm afraid of the South. Anyways, there's one other thing that we wanted to talk about. No, this is our longest episode ever. <laughs> Talking about it anyways. Um, okay. Yeah, there you go. That's our our last bit of business, I believe. Except for thanking Mark L.S. Stone, Lisa Wilde, the venerable Dr. Rish Outfield, and uh, all the voice actors who helped out and uh, 
anybody who listened all the way to the end of this very long that's right episode thanks uh, everybody and we'll be back again soon why not yeah let's do it The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Oh, that's long. <laughs>